days, I bet. Dr. Dre in the place to be. Co rocking shit with my homeboy Steve. At the rodeo, get stupid, son. Yo, don't think that you can get none of the Dre. The motherfucking doctor, the bitch hopper, the sucker motherfucking stopper. I'm fucked up, so don't mind what I'm saying. I'm just kicking it. But Steve, Tony, A. M. Susan, yo, we can choose it. Dope shit to put in a mix. Know what I'm saying? We kick shit like and and. That's a fact. And if your shit ain't in a mix, you know it's whack. And that ain't no bullshit. I'm kicking facts on a serious tip. Word up, Dr. Dre's in full effect, doing serious damage, boy. Tony, hey, 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 Tony, hey. When you're ready, go. Welcome back, everybody, to Rodium Radio, episode one. 28 uh man every time i say like 120 something it's like fuck i'm still here but yeah so thanks to you guys thanks to the subscribers everybody who's on the live chat everybody who's subscribed everybody who's commented everybody i don't care if it's negative or positive you guys are still here so that's all that matters but this rodian radio cannot be successful without you guys so uh let me go ahead and give a couple of announcements once again i want to encourage you guys to buy an ad go to documentary forward slash ad Documentary forward slash ad. Get all the details there. So if you own a business, uh, I mean, if you own a restaurant, uh, if you own a, you know, if you want to promote your OnlyFans page, it doesn't matter. Whatever. Buy a one minute ad, and we will play during the commercial breaks. We average at least about uh, about a half a million views monthly. We average about 10k views per episode. So you'll have at least about 10,000 people looking at your business. So it's good business. It's smart business. So get at us at documentary forward slash ads. Once again, for those of you that have bought uh, merch, uh, CDs or whatever, everything is on its way. I did all the orders today. We were backed up a little bit because we had so many, but um, you're going to get them eventually. So uh, they're already mailed out. So other than that, listen, um, for this interview today, I'm like super geeked out. Like I don't give a shit. I'll admit it. I, I truly am because I'm a fan of music. I love music. And my next special guest, you know what, is somebody, at least for me, considered a legend in this game. And uh, without further ado, please allow me to introduce Eric Bobo of Cypress Hill. What the deal, man? <laughs> Here we are. Here we are, brother. That's Here we good, are. Man. You know what? Uh, first and foremost, I want to say that I'm thankful. I'm glad that you're giving me the opportunity to be able to sit across from you and interview you. Oh, thank you for the opportunity. It's always good to, you know, be able to chop it up and, you know, really talk about some good good times, good stuff, you know? Yes, yes. You know, for the people that may not know, I want to share how I first met you. Uh, it was actually through Steve Yano, rest in peace. Yeah. And uh, you had recorded some uh, some percussions with proper those Frank and Ernie G uh, in Alhambra and Steve's studio. I remember I walked in and I listened to the congas and everything that was being played. And I said, who in the fuck is that? You know, and Steve said, you know, that's uh, Eric Bobo. And I said, Eric Bobo? And he said, yeah, he goes, you need him? And I go, I got some stuff that I'm doing. I said, I need a dope percussion. He said, he said okay, I'll hook him up. I said, okay, cool. Um, he gives me, uh, he actually, he said he calls you, sets it up for a certain day. Uh, that day didn't happen for some reason. But now, 1994, the Northridge quake hits. Mm -hmm. I think that was January 11th. On the 12th, I showed up to the studio and I said, hey, Steve, can you call him and ask him if he can make it? He goes, dude, we just had a quake, but I'll ask him. And you showed up. I remember that. <laughs> oh, shit. I remember that. Yeah. Man, I mean, first of all, getting together with Steve Yano, I mean, it came through uh, a friend of mine called, uh, his name is Stuart Weiland. Yes. And he was doing a bunch of session work. He did stuff on, I think, High Seas Record, I yes. think. And uh, me and him had a group together. You know, and he said, yo, you know, uh, uh, he, he knew that I did session work and everything like that. So he said, you know, I, I got a gig, you know. His wife actually sung the hook on One Summer Night on the Proper Dose Mexican Power album. So it was all kind of connected like that. So he had me come on down. I met Steve Yano and uh, I played the track. I, I, I met the guys. And you know, I just brought my shit. I just brought my my, my conga drums, you know, 
no 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 drum tech no anything just came and uh laid it down like really quick you know i guess uh everybody was like kind of tripping out that i just heard the track kind of once one one time and then you know i just laid it down so they they threw another track at me and then you know every now and again you know steve was calling me up for you know for work and that's when you know that happened you know as far as you know meeting meeting up with you and now I remember that after the the quake you yeah. know <laughs> that that's that's crazy that's crazy that's you, really crazy you know man first of all i'm glad that steve introduced us and steve actually introduced me even to stewart stewart mm -hmm. wyland which i haven't seen or talked to in years i don't know if you have seen or talked to him he's in asia somewhere okay okay yeah. And a lot of people don't know, and I want to make an announcement. You know, a lot of people don't know, not that it's really big, but the contribution that he made because in the mid 90s, I started working with a lot of Chicano rappers, you know, from like Frost to like Little Rob to like uh, uh, Don Cisco, Slow Pain, uh, JV. And I can name a lot of these Chicano rappers that I worked with in like 96, 97, 98. And the musician that I used to create all those Chicano rap tracks was from Stuart Weiland. Now, a lot of people may not know, but he wasn't Chicano. He was he was Jewish. Very much so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, but the thing about Stuart is that he was a funky motherfucker. Yeah. And he played all these instruments. I mean, guitar, bass, keyboards, flute. I mean, you name it. Yeah. He could play it. So you know he, he was a good you know uh drum programmer everything like that and when we had a group together we were going record over at his house because he had all this uh the the equipment yes and this was before me joining up and doing stuff with bc boys or cypress or anything else this was early on i was over in college over at uh usc mm -hmm. so um it was just crazy that you know i mean he was getting in and then also the thing about him is that during the day he would be doing temp work like uh, uh you know he knew how to type yeah but he was one of those people that like typed like 150 words a minute like 200 words a minute so he always got a job like quick you know yes. but other than that it was music and he can write his ass off play his ass off and you know i'm glad that he just like asked me for you know if i was down for the gig and i mean i to be honest i did not know steve yano's contribution to to the la music scene and in hip-hop and and, and chicano rap the whole thing I, I did not have any clue um i came to erica stewart but then i see i'm like oh okay i know about him yeah and then started to connect the dots yeah you know yeah. so uh you know I, I i came in by you know accident but for you know what you know i was i was in yeah you know you know it's funny when i was producing high c's first album 1991 uh no 1990 but it was released in 91 uh i had had the demo i was telling b this that uh funk incline that used to be a hollywood records rest in peace he uh gave me the first cypress hill demo and I loved B's, of course, and Sen's voice right off the bat. I was trying to get Funk and Klein to try to talk to B because we were trying to get a verse on High C's record. Now, I remember what Funk said that B Real told him. He said, right now, we're not doing any features, like during that time. And that was very, very true. It was almost like right. they were reserving themselves, you know. And I, and I, I thought that that was a great, like, scheme or business move because today you know there's so many rappers on everybody's tracks mm -hmm. you know it's almost like they don't reserve themselves to just be themselves you know right. or, you know uh, uh like for an example uh today you have so many features on one album that it's almost like a compilation you know i agree and and today i mean back then cypress hill was cypress hill you know wu-tang was wu-tang and it's important you know i mean you you want to make your own voice yes. you know and i think that you know, if you, you have an album and it's great to get, you know, features on it, but you kind of like trying to capitalize off of their thing. That's why you have them on the album there as a feature a lot of times. Yeah. Sometimes it's your real true homies, but when you get like, you have 22 songs and 20 of them are with features <laughs> and just two of them are solo, you know, you're, you're trying to get their, their, right. their, their extra, you know, 
uh, thing. But I come from the school of like, you know, little to no features, you know, was fine because you, you had a group. It was a group. You yeah. didn't need anyone else. I mean, you had B-Real, you had Send Dog, you know, you had Mugs, and, and that was it. I mean, there wasn't a feature on the Cypress Hill record until the third album. Yeah. And that was with uh, RZA and, and You Got. Yeah. You know, and if you're going to have a first feature, why not with them? But, yeah. you know, it was an important thing that you had to keep your own sound. Yes. You know, it's not about jumping on anybody else's, you know, thing you know and you know you know whoever does that it's cool but well you know we're not from that school right right now you know switching gears here up a little bit i wanted to ask you because this is pretty much what's trending and i think you guys might have touched on it on yesterday's podcast i believe uh, or might might have been today's the night stalker have you seen it i have not seen it but i remember that shit <laughs> i remember that shit that shit was nuts yes you know and nobody wanted to go out you know Right. I mean, I remember that. And you, then, yeah. You know what's one thing that I was sharing with my guys heard earlier? That just like every Mexican family has a story that the devil somehow appeared to them. Mm -hmm. You know, se, le, se me pareció el diablo. Mm -hmm. You know, for some reason, even in the 80s, every Mexican family believed that they saw the Night Stalker. I think that was him. He was standing in the alley. He was looking at me. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> everybody has their own fucking story. So uh, uh, watching it, of course, you know, they show a gang of footage, you know, uh, the dude had the a via shoe. Uh, he didn't have like a certain type of pattern of how he killed people, and that's what threw detectives off. Right. Uh, but it was a good documentary. I, I don't want to check it. I need to check it. Uh, I just remember that. Uh, I mean, it wasn't all that far away from you know where I grew up. I grew up in like the Mount Washington Highland Park area. Okay. So uh, you know, being not too far from East LA, Boyle Heights, all that stuff where stuff was happening, it was like, oh shit, he's not all that far away. You know, so uh, it, it, it was just an, uh, a nutty time, you know, and just the way it was on the news and everything. And, and, and you know, who was, who was telling me about it? I think it was today. We're talking about the Night Stalker thing, you know. B said, yo, you need to check that out because they got some other stuff that they didn't really talk about and cover before and whatnot, and they go deeper in. I'm like, I'm into all that shit. Yeah. I'm yeah. into that murder shit. Me too. You know, me, 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 me and my, my girl, we like, I can look at the news, but then after that, we're looking at forensic files and autopsies. And that, yeah, yeah, all that murder <laughs> shit, you know. So there's this commercial or there's some shit, or there was this meme of some some woman that was cleaning up in a house, and you hear in the background, yeah, just got decapitated, uh, murder, and you now blood everywhere. And he does like nonchalantly, like cleaning shit, you know, like, is that murder shit? Right, right. I like that shit too. <laughs> you, you, you know, I'll tell you what. Uh, I think the closest that I ever came to, like a, for the sake of the conversation, a celebrity murderer. Remember the Menendez brothers? Yep. Okay. Hell yeah. I went to go visit my brother in the county jail. And they were telling everybody, walk this way, walk this way. He'll be coming out right here. So I turned around and I saw a lady, a blonde, she was blonde hair with a big mink coat. And I kept looking at her like, you know, she doesn't look like they had all the Chicanos and the blacks and everybody on this side. Right. But over here, they just had one guy coming in and I couldn't see her face. And I was trying to look at her. She had a gold rings. Like she just looked like she was paid. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then they bring out one of the Menendez brothers and they had his ass. Like we were, I was like this close. This was his window. And uh, I look at him and he looks at me and he goes, and I was like, fuck you then you know mm -hmm. but yeah dude i saw one of those motherfuckers but it's yeah, funny it creep me out, out man i oh, shit that you know? fucking creep me out because they, they were crazy man those are the Do guys that, that shit. yeah killed their parents yeah for fucking money yeah but <laughs> okay you know what you actually answered one of my questions because i was going to ask you where originally are you from like where did you grow up at uh i was born in new york okay born in uh hollis queens where run dmc and mm. all them. uh so uh I have mad family out there, but my background is a Puerto Rican descent. Okay. Uh, but I was raised out here on the West Coast. We came out here, I was like 13 months old. So West Coast is, that's home, you know? Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm West Coast. My bro brother, older brother, 14 years older than me, was raised out there in New York. So like I said, you know, my, my parents, born in New York, so there was East Coast, and I was the first one to be here on the West Coast. Okay, okay. Now, it, here's an interesting question that I personally would like to know because you being a musician, producer, percussionist, 
all of the above. Uh, you growing up in your parents' home, uh, what type of music would you say you were raised with? What would your mother or your father play? Salsa, Latin jazz, um, you know, everything from Tito Puente to Santana to uh, to funk, Earth, Wind & Fire, uh, the funky stuff, Parliament Funkadelic, uh, to groups like um, Tierra, El Chicano, and the trip about it is that, you know, my dad was playing with a lot, you know, a lot of the clubs around in L.A., playing places like the Pasta House and places like, you know, in East L.A. And there was a lot of times that he opened up, you know, well, not that he opened up, but like Tierra and El Chicano would be opening up for him. Wow. So I got a chance to see some of these groups like when, when she was hot. And actually my dad uh, did some co-production on uh, Tierra's album City City Lights, okay. which, which is the, the album that has together on it. Oh wow! So my my dad did did some stuff with that. So I was hearing everything. I was hearing everything. That was that was my school. So it wasn't I wasn't just stuck to one thing. Yeah, you know. And and my my dad made sure that I I listened to everything. And I was hearing stuff when my brother was listening to from everything from Jimi Hendrix to James Brown to that, and then what my friends were listening to in school, which was like the more funk, R&B, you know, from Slave to Zap to, you know, uh, people like that, you know, Ohio players. Yeah. You know, so, so the whole gamut, the whole gamut. Yeah, yeah. You know, now, now let me ask you this because uh, um, what, what was one thing that maybe your dad might have taught you, maybe multiple things that you still carry with you today, for an example, my father, if people could ask me, what, what is one thing your father might have taught you? My father introduced me to uh, black and white movies. He introduced me to film, he introduced me to comedy, he introduced me like to Bob Hope, uh, you know, Bing Crosby type of comedy. You didn't have to curse to be funny. He introduced me to uh, uh, boleros, like Spanish music, mm -hmm. uh, to a, a lot of different things. So my father, film and music, that's one thing that I can say that uh, he instilled in me. And I think that's where... I got my influences to move into the the musical if it world. What, what is one thing that you can say that you still carry with you today? Maybe your father might have showed you, taught you, or something. Um, you know, my 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 dad kind of uh, he had, he had an appreciation for like uh, you know the film stuff and 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 I would watch stuff with him like the old gangster films and old black and white cowboy and western things. But I think the thing that I carry with me is that he always told me to, you know, to be humble. And even though, you know, I'm in this business, whatever, I can feel like, I can feel great that I'm a, 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 a great musician inside, but outwardly not, not, not portray myself as that. Uh, because there's always somebody out there that, you know, may not have that opportunity and could be better than you. And for you, you know, being too confident or too cocky, you can lose your shit, you know, yeah. in an instant, you know. And so always, you know, I mean, you know, know, know your worth, stand your ground, but also be humble. And and I think that that's, that's what's kind of kept me being able to work with different people and everything like that and just getting where I fit in, you know what I mean? I'm lucky to be here, you know. I, I, I know that there's a lot of musicians that, would love to be able to be on stage and, 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 and tour the world and do all that stuff. So, you know, I can't really take it for granted. Yeah. So those are the kind of things that he instilled in, 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 in me. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, um, did, so I know you said you came out here when you were about 13 months old. Did you ever go back and visit a lot of New York? Oh yeah. All the time, all the time. And I mean, that's where I was, you know, discovering our, early stuff of hip hop, you know. Okay. Uh even right before then it was like the the freestyle kind of thing that was going on. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it was Sugar Hill and and the Rapper's Delight, you know, and the early, early hip hop, you know, and stuff in which had a lot of percussion. Yeah. If you you know, all all that Rapper's Delight and Curtis Blow and all that stuff, that was all live musicians and so you know, you had Timbale solos and you heard the conga drums, you heard all that stuff. So I'm like, oh, I can do this. I can I can rock to this. I felt like it was something that I can gravitate to. It's not something that I was doing because 
it was what my dad was doing. You know, right. I felt I felt something close to it, but at the same time, no one was doing that. Like, eventually, you know, it became more pure of MCs and a DJ and no band. So uh, I still felt like you know I can get in, but there wasn't really anybody doing it. But luckily, I just had to do it and just got in. Yeah, uh, around what age would you say you started? Uh, you know. Playing around with the instruments. Shit, like three, three years old, but I first hit the stage professionally at five. Professionally? Yes, I was at I was five years old, my first gig. Wow. My dad. Okay, okay, before you tell me about that gig, I, I'm gonna share something with you. And I shared it with uh as a matter of fact, I, I believe I shared it when I was with, with you guys at Dr. Green Thumbs. Um I remember when I first saw uh, I was just a young teenager and I saw DJ Joe Cooley get off on the turntables. And to me, it was like, it was just something out of this world. Mm -hmm. I was like, what the fuck? Like, I've never seen anything like it before. Uh, he's dope. Yeah. So and then in the 80s again, I saw Tony G. And I saw Tony G cutting it up. He was moving and dancing differently from Joe. But later on, I got to see that he was also a percussionist, you know. Mm -hmm. this, this I, I told Tony, I thought he was a phenomenon. Just like I told Joe, he, I believe he was too. But that night, after the Northridge quake, when you came and you started playing, I saw the same thing that I saw in those two guys, in you. I just thought, this guy right here is fucking amazing. And I have yet, okay, I have yet to still run into a percussionist, in my humble opinion, that can outdo Eric Bobo. Okay, thanks, thanks for your words, <laughs> but man, man, I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not really... Uh... Thank you for your words, but I'm not really good at like accepting like all of that, but I just try to get in where I fit in. You know what I mean? It's like my dad showed me, you know, how to listen to music and how to, how to add certain things to it. You know what I mean? There's a lot of percussionists that even though they know how to play, they can't really, ad they can't adapt to like the hip hop mentality as far as how not to overplay and how not to you know uh be too loud how to you know be dynamic how to and you know all that stuff and i'm a student of hip-hop i love hip-hop that's where i grew up listening to that i mean all all their public enemy beastie boys i was listening to beastie boys big fan of theirs not knowing like seven eight years later i would be touring with them yeah but it was like all that stuff, it just, all the stuff I was doing with my dad prepared me for stuff that I was doing with BCs and Cypress and so forth. And even proper dose, yeah. you know what I mean? Because to be honest, that was my first, the first album that I had my name like a credit. Wow. Wow. And a lot of people, a lot of people don't know that. I, I've said that. Uh, a few times and I mean I've even acknowledged you know Ernie G I, I, I told him man, you know he's even hit me up and like yo it's dope that you know you you, you said that and I'm like yo I'm not gonna lie you know yeah. as far I had been playing before I mean I had been I'd been playing like Playboy Jazz Festival Monterey Jazz Festival played with Tito Puente Ella Fitzgerald and my dad and jammed with so many great jazz people but I wasn't on a record and I didn't have my name on the record yet. <laughs> so to have my name on, on something, uh, like a hip hop record, cause to me it was hip hop record. It wasn't on Chicano rap. It was just a hip hop record. Yeah. That was, that was, that was a shit for me. That was a shit. That's dope. You know what? I mean, and not only did you, you know, be uh, are a part of that hip hop record. And I'm glad you said that because back then it wasn't called Chicano rap. It was just, they were artists. It was just that it was, on, you know, I mean, Look, even today, you don't, you know, with white artists, the white, uh, you know, MCs, it's not white rap, you know, it's not black rap, you know, it's, it was never that, you know, but I think, unfortunately, a label was put on to the movement that maybe kind of held it down more than, than it should have, Yeah, you know what I mean? And I mean, it's not... I'm not dissing to anybody, but I just think that sometimes, you know, we can put a label on something that can really diminish 
the full potential of what it can be because it could be labeled in a way that may not be accepted to the masses. I mean, it took a minute for, you know, the masses to adopt to hip hop, but once it, they did, and once, once you go platinum and plus, you're no longer, you're out of the hood. Yeah. You're out of the hood. You're now in middle America. Now you're starting to spread out. There's nothing wrong with that, but that's, that's the reality of it. But there's some great artists in, 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 in hip hop and, and Chicano rap that could have sold more than just 20,000 copies, 30,000 copies, you know, could have been way more. Agreed. Agreed. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask you a question that uh, I like to ask everyone that comes through here. Um, I know you mentioned a couple of great albums, already great artists that you work with. But if you were to, if I were to ask you, give me your top five, uh, whether it's group or whether it's albums from the East Coast, your top five albums. They don't necessarily have to be in order. But do you, th these are just classic records to you. Who, who would they be? In hip hop? Yeah, just in East Coast. Um, first two public enemy records. Okay. Uh, it takes a nation of millions and uh, Joe Bum Rush to show. Um, I would say uh, a tribe called Quest, uh, Low End Theory. Yes. I would say uh, Ultra Magnetics. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I would say, wow, it's toss up, but like. You know, uh, King of Rock, you know, Run the MC, and you know, uh, Eric B and Rock him, you know, paying him full. Um, so many of those, you know, right. those artists out there, you know, it's. I would have to agree it, with all of those. It, it's it's just amazing. It is amazing. I mean, for me, Public Enemy is my all time favorite group, and I say that because just the way that it. I mean, when Chuck D spoke. It's like made me like stand at attention, like yes, the way that he just commanded it. You know, I mean, I mean, I saw them when they got booed at USC because Professor Griff was talking all this anti-Semitic stuff, and right. you don't do that at USC. <laughs> <laughs> not not in front of a predominantly white school, but you know, Chuck me knowing him now and, and can consider him a you know a friend as well as a brother he knew how to command the microphone and this voice the the, the power so he was always like my my all-time favorite but again you know they, they they try to label that militant rap you know conscious rap yes yes you know all this kind of stuff all right that's cool and they could put it into a box but I don't, for, for me, like getting back to the thing of like the, the Ch Chicano rap label is like, I think that uh, the word Chicano maybe not is the word that makes it like, okay, like, you know what I mean? It, it's not the best word. Right. Okay. It's not the best word. So, you know, I think like you have a group like, like Psycho Realm. That, I don't consider them Chicano rap. Right. No, you're, you're, you're right. Nothing about that. It's just like, like that. But, you know, you know, they, they were going on to mainstream. I mean, they helped, helped with Cypress and then they were doing their things. I mean, both talented, everything like that. Those are my bros. But they didn't get pigeonholed in that. Right. Yeah. So. I'll I tell you what. When I heard this bass, how low can you go? Death row, what a brother know. Once again, back is the end. Dude, I fell in love. Well, I fell in love with Public Enemy, bro. Man, is, I still <laughs> hear that song. I still hear that song. And I, I will I will go word for word on that. <laughs> still. I mean, I remember we were touring with Public Enemy on the Smoking Grooves tour in the uh, mid-90s. And I saw every show. There was like 35 shows on that tour. Damn. I saw Public Enemy 35 times. Wow. And I just was watching. I'm like, oh my God. There he, there he is. Yeah. Look at how he just like killing it. That's killing awesome. it. You know what I mean? And and that, that feeling was like incredible. You know, like, you know, Ice Cube, 
like when he did America's Most Wanted, that wasn't a, a West Coast sound. No. That was that was Bomb Squad. That was some that was some other shit. You know what I mean? But man, I mean, I give props to the East Coast, you know, they definitely have paved they helped pave the way, but you know, I think that everyone has had their 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 run, you know what I mean? Yeah. They're, they're, they've shown their power. West Coast, the South, you know what I mean? Yeah. Dope. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to go ahead and press pause right there. Uh, we're going to take a 10 minute break. We're going to come right back, and I'm going to ask you your top five West Coast albums. Awesome. Let's do it. Okay, everybody. Once again, my friends, make sure you call somebody, text somebody, slap the shit out of somebody. Let them know that Eric Bobo from Cypress Hills in the motherfucking building. We'll be back. Don't fuck around. 10 minutes. What's up guys, this is Danny with 310 Micheladas. We have our uh, classic 310 Michelada right here. Comes with two beers of your choice. We uh, prep it up with our own chamoy mix. And then um, comes with two beers, like I said, pineapple, uh, chamoy candy. This is our new 310 Dark Tropicana. This one right here comes with uh, pineapple chunks, our own mix. Of course, the two uh, pineapple rings and three shots of Hennessy. That's right, three shots of Hennessy. So we do give the option to infuse them with CBD or THC. Every five milligrams will be uh, $3 extra. And then for CBD, every five milligrams will be $5 extra. We do offer catering services. We do events, family gatherings, small parties, you name it. We also do deliver and we do pickup orders. Uh, make sure to follow us on Instagram, 310 Micheladas. Slap the shit out of somebody. Let them know that Rolling Radio is live up in this yard.
Welcome back, everybody, to Rotary Radio episode 128. I hope you guys had enough time to warm up your top ramen and get yourself a modelo and sit right in front of your TVs to watch Rodium Radio with none other than Eric Bobo from the legendary group Cypress Hill. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So uh, before the break, I had to hit you up for five East Coast West classic albums of all time. If you can give me your top five West Coast or First it was East Coast, now West Coast classics. Okay. Uh, not to be biased, but I will say debut album, Cypress Hill. Uh, I will say um, uh, uh, what's it? Uh, I, will, I will have to say La Raza of uh, Kid Cross. That was a big one. N.W.A. Uh, Straight Outta Compton. That was amazing um Rodney Owen Joe Cooley that everlasting bass that was Ooh. that <laughs> right there that was it you know and and also one more for me and it was underrated but for me the very first Psycho Realm album was something that was so different 
uh, and it was just a different a different sound. But that shit was it was L A. It was West Coast. Dope, dope. Well, you know what? I always include uh, Cypress Hill first album, the debut album, always in my top five. Mm-hmm. And this is not in a row. I would have to say, of course, uh, the Easy E album, the first NWA album. Yep. Uh, I'd have to say the first Chronic album, uh, Cypress Hill. And I also always include, uh, even though this is probably not West Coast, more like you know, down south, if you will. Uh, um, what was it called? Uh, the my mind's playing tricks on me. Ghetto Boys. Oh, uh, Ghetto Boys. Yeah, we can't be stopped. I think that's what it's called. Yeah, 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 yeah. I yeah. mean, Ghetto Boys. I mean, you know what? I'm I'm now. I've been listening to a lot of uh, uh, or revisiting Southern hip hop, like you know, from the South. Because uh, like during the pandemic, I was kind of quarantined out in San Antonio, uh, and. I was like listening and hearing a lot of, you know, uh, UGK and, you know, stuff down Memphis and things like that. And like, wow, there was, you know, there was really some stuff popping, popping over. And then also, you know, with Ghetto Boys, you know, they were always a top, top group. You know, I don't know if I considered them exactly like West Coast, but, you know, the thing with West Coast and also with like Southern hip hop they they use live instruments. Yeah. You know, I mean you hear NWA, Dr. Dre's, you know, from even the chronic everything, those were live instruments. You know, in the South Outcast, UGK, they use live instruments as well as samples, but they use the live instruments. So they're you know, and it's also funky. It was funky. You know, I think the boom bap that was more East Coast. Like yeah. boom bap that one. But when you was able to get into that soul and the you know the kind of funky thing that was like West Coast and and South. Yeah, yeah, man. What were your thoughts? And I pretty much probably already know when you heard the first uh, Dr. Dre Chronic album. Wow, I was like, man, this this is a reinvention. Yeah, like he, that's that's what I felt like because you know after you know leaving you know easy and all that kind of stuff you might wonder what's he gonna do and everything like this and it was just like a reinvention and he came back so strong it was like it was wild i mean i was like playing that on repeat for a while (laughs) a while yeah same same thing same thing you you know uh there are certain records uh that i believe have totally changed the music uh like for an example at least in my opinion, I can go from Easy E slash NWA changed music. Mm-hmm. Then, uh, and when I say music, I'm talking about rap. Mm-hmm. And the first Cypress Hill record, uh, I told B this when he was here. And I said, I don't give a shit what anybody says. Everybody was writing Cypress Hill's nuts when that first record dropped. Everybody was trying to sound, well, get that sound. And I know Muggs was probably hounded. Produce a track, you know, do me a track, do me this, do me that. Okay, I, we all know as a producer and a DJ, we all know those people that were, because they wanted that sound, they changed the music. You know, uh, uh, before I ever met B and Sin, I, I went to their shows. Mm-hmm. And and some of the greatest performances that I've ever seen, and I'll repeat what I told B when he was here. Um, KRS-One, Easy e obviously NWA, uh, uh, Cypress Hill. The, the, the shows, the energy, everything, everything. And then when you came on board, it just elevated to a, a whole new level, a whole new level, you know, because I, I remember, I remember when we were talking, you were like, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm, I, I don't remember the quite the words, but you were saying you were teaming up, you were meeting with them, you're, uh, you were gonna be a part of it or something of that nature. And then eventually you started, uh, I saw you in a video playing Boom, 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 boom. Uh, what was it? Mm. So you want to be a rock? Yeah, 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 rock right, superstar. Yeah, yeah. Um, the trip about the trip about that is that you know I was a Cypress Hill fan too. Uh-huh. Uh huh. I was going to USC at the time, and I very the first time I heard Cypress Hill, uh, I was actually going to go pick up some weed <laughs> from uh, <laughs> from the Connect, you know, the Connect over at SC, you know. <laughs> And uh, he was listening to, you know, Cypress, and I hear Hole in the Head and the Funky Feel one, and I'm like, the music is bumping. And I'm two things stood out. 
One is that they're talking about weed. Like, straight up talking about weed. And two, I'm like, is he really, is this guy really, like, rapping like that? <laughs> you know, like, that, that that real nasal, like, really? Like, I mean, but it sounds kind of cool. It's, like, different, but right. it's, like, it was, like, wow. And then the contrast between him and uh, Sin, you know, like, the backwards uh, Chuck D, Flavor Flav, yes. you know, High Low. And then I saw them at a at a at a show in Lincoln Heights, like some sort of like little at the park at the park. And that shit got broken up, you know. They played twenty minutes, and then you know a fight, you know, somebody got stabbed or whatnot. All right, so go forward. I start doing stuff with the Beastie Boys. I get the itinerary, and it's a month long tour. So it's Beastie Boys, Rollins Band, Henry Rollins from Black Flag. And the first two weeks, it was Ice Cube and the Lynch Mob. Really? That was it. It was Lynch Mob. And it was a trip because you hear them doing songs like Buck a Devil, Buck a Devil, all this stuff to all these white <laughs> audiences. I'm like, I don't know if this is really, really going to go too, too well, you know? And after they got off the tour, the second half, the opener was Cypress Hill. So the first show was in Florida, and I remember, like, you know, I'm like, wow, Cypress Hill is going to be on it. This is going to be cool. Oh, shit, you know? So I remember the first one that I met was Send Dog. And we're in the hotel, and he's walking toward me, and I'm walking toward him, and we're both, like, looking at each other, staring at each other, and, like, boom, and just walk back. And then look back. And in my mind, I'm, like, thinking, Oh shit, that was fucking send off. <laughs> you know, and 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 then we we went to a game, whatever like that, and then I started hanging out with them. Like on their bus. I'm with the Beastie Boys, but I'm I'm hanging out with with the guys on their bus. Yeah. They had really good weed. <laughs> and uh they were they were kind of crazy, you know what I mean? And I was still kind of shy with the BCs, but I was able to like let my hair down a little bit with Cypress. Right, right. So I after that I started hanging out with Send Dog, you know, and then I did my first show with Cypress at El Camino College. I played one song. I played Latin Lingo, mm. and then like about some weeks later, it says, "Yo, you're coming with us on the road." Soul Assassins Tour, 93. Wow. Uh, that's with House of Pain, Cypress, Funk Dubious, Hooligans. And this is, is a big tour. Now, granted, my thing was that, you know, even though I went on the tour with the BC Boys, I was kind of playing when it was the band thing. Right. And again, during that time, it was a purest thing with the DJ and, 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 and MCs. It wasn't really about anybody else on stage. So when them bringing me along, it was like a different sound, a different look. Yeah. You know, and I remember the manager first gig was like, okay, now uh, make sure that you don't play too loud. Make sure you don't do it. Uh, he was trying to tell me how to play <laughs> on the show. Man, I got this. I got this. So what made them or what made Sen convince B and then for them to convince Muggs of bringing on a percussionist when it was a purest time of hip hop is still beyond me Wow! because no one else was doing it. No one. No one else was doing it. And when uh, Muggs was starting to get like compliments like from guys out there on the East Coast like his buddies like yo man and the percussion man that shit is dope and plus you know they knew of my father being all the producers that were digging and sampling and stuff like that. You know, you get to know the artists and, and they knew of my dad, especially yeah. not there in New York. They knew of my dad. So it was kind of like, all right. It, it's almost like I felt like I got a pass. Okay. I just had to, you know, show myself and the rest became like history. And then I was flip flopping between them and BC boys for like two and a half years. So, both groups were at the top of the game yeah. at, at that time. So I just felt blessed to be in two of the most 
influential names of hip hop at that time and now ever. Wow. Yeah. That 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 was that was awesome. I I, I was when I was talking to B here, I remember when they did that remix of what you want with the Beastie Boys. I love that shit, man. Yeah. That's still one of my favorites. But I still say that when I saw you guys rocking and I saw you up there playing percussion, me loving music, me loving hip hop, man, I, I was just looking at something incredible because like what you said, nobody was doing it. Nobody was doing it. So that was different for me. And, and, and I just loved it, you know, like for like when I said earlier, I was geeked out about this anyway because I love music. You know, not just hip hop, but I love music in general. You know, a lot of people don't know that um, when I'm in my car and I'm driving, I'm going to the way, go on my way to the gym. I don't listen to rap. I listen to classical music. That's what I like to listen to. You know, yeah. uh, sometimes oldies, but I rarely ever bump uh, hip hop unless I'm at home and I just some old school shit from sexy for a master of the ceremony or ultra magnetic MCs or mm. uh, Stetsa Sonic. You know, I grew up on uh, East Coast. You know, uh, hip hop. That's what was what was given to us. Yes. And then before you know it, Ice T. You know, Mix Master Spade, Toddy T, N.W.A. And then the West Coast blooms. Right. So uh, I'm fortunate and blessed to have been a part of it and grew up with good music and to be able to sit across someone who, in my eyes, is a legend. and has got a star in the Hollywood Walk of Fame for me. It's amazing. Oh, thank so. you. I, you know, the, the thing with the music, it, I, I was lucky that, you know, with, you know, my dad was always getting records and, and a lot of stuff that now was like being sampled. Uh -huh. I remember when that stuff was coming out because my dad was getting all these records and that's what I would do in my room. I would plus play records um, in, in on my turntable, on my little turntable. And the, I had the turntable that you could still stack the, the <laughs> LPs on the top. You could put like three or four LPs, you know, and then you could flip them all. Uh, and like my dad would play Rise by Herb Albert. Yes. I would play that with him. Years later, that becomes sampled and becomes one of the biggest hip hop songs through, you know, uh, Biggie, you know, Notorious B.I.G. Yes. Okay. Yes. You know, a lot of, you know, the Bob James stuff from, from and, you know, Tribe Called Quest, the Gangstar, all these, I'm like, I know all these songs, like this is like original, so I, I know this. Yeah. Cause that's what I would just like listen to. I didn't, I was rating my, my, my brother's collection who he had like Izzy brothers, earth, wind and fire, you know, James Brown, Jimi Hendrix, people like that, Jackson five, mm -hmm. you know, and then my dad, we were getting like stuff like weather report, return to forever, the jazz fusion stuff like that. And then the old like salsa stuff with Tito Puente and El Gran Combo, Fania fin uh, All Stars, all of that shit, I was hearing it all. But that the music is just it just it was just overpowering, you know. what I mean right. the whole thing. Uh, um, w when you started per percussion, uh, playing percussion, because I know you said you went live professionally at, at uh, five years old with your father. Um, uh, silly question. Did you like performing? Once the music started, yeah. Okay. Because I was scared shitless otherwise. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, there's pictures. Uh, recently there was an exhibition on my father that was uh, going down here in L.A. And it was only open and then COVID happened and it's oh. closed, closed the exhibition. But, I mean, there were pictures of my first performance. And you just see me like I'm scared, shitless, all these people around. It was just my dad. I'm in a club, a 21 and over club. I'm five years old, drinking a fucking virgin Shirley Temple, you know, and in the fucking corner and stuff like that. You know, I was scared. But the minute that the music came on, yeah, then I was cool. Yeah, yeah. And when the music stopped, then I realized where I was at. And then it was like all these people over me, like, oh my God, so cute, and boom, boom, and crowd, and everything, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, I just want to get, I want to get out of here. You know what <laughs> I mean? But uh, yeah, that was uh, on the stage, no fear. No fear. And I think that, I mean, 
my dad, I don't know how he knew, but I mean, I would take out like the pots and pans I would I would jam on them. Uh I would take the records out of the jacket and the vinyl. Right. And I would put them on the ground and I would I would spin them like they were on a turntable. Wow. I ruined a lot of records, classic <laughs> records like that. To cool me out, they would put me in the high chair and, and in front of the turntable and I would watch it spin and that cooled me out. Wow. So I, I would play along with something and I was like maybe two years old and I would keep the rhythm. My brother and my mother would like, they would tell me this all the time. It was like, they were like shocked because I was keeping a rhythm, like no problem. So it was there. I had no rehearsal for my first gig. It is okay. This is what you're going to do. You're going to play this song. Nah. Wow. wow. So, I mean, there was sometimes I play with my dad and I'm like, okay, what's the song? What are we going to play? And he'll say, you'll figure it out. And he'll count it off. He didn't even tell me. Wow. I had to, I had to listen to it. Yeah. Uh, now, what, what, which one were you playing? Everything all at once? Gongas, bongos. Is that all the same? No. Uh, to to be honest, my I mean, I started out with conga, you know, which is like the bigger drums. You know, yes. the bongos are like the smaller ones you play between your legs or whatnot, and timbales are two drums that you can play with sticks and it has like cowbells and stuff. Um, to me, my main acts, to be honest, is timbales. Okay. I mean, I I played congas and everything like that, but my my main acts with timbales. When I would play with my dad, I was playing timbales. Wow. And it wasn't until I started in school and college that I was playing more conga and then playing with the BCs and everything. I was playing, I was playing it all, you know. I had a crazy setup, you know what I mean? As as time went on, you know, I, I I just went all out. I tried to get my inner rock star on. I was like, yeah, give me the gong, <laughs> give me all this shit. I want all these bells. I want shit to be way that high up. I, I have to jump up and do it. I wanted all that shit. You wow. Know, I simplify that shit now. I'm not jumping for shit now. <laughs> <laughs> not not silly question. Are you are you really good? Because I've never seen anybody really really play it. Are you good at playing the quicker? Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I used to do that a lot with the BC Boys. I had a, even a Quica solo. Really? There was a song called Lighten Up, which is like on some real percussive 6 8 kind of rhythm thing. And I'd have a Quica solo. The thing is, is like I never played Quica before playing with the BC Boys. Really? So you just picked it up and it was YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was before YouTube, but there was that kind of shit, you know? I was like, okay, all right, how you do it? All right, I'll figure it out. Wow. Now, uh, um, now let me ask you this. I think you pretty much explained it already, and I could see it, but uh, there are some people that learn an instrument, whether it's a turntable, whether it's a laptop, whether it's, a, I don't know, whatever. But some people learn how to get good, and some people are just naturals at it. Would you say, Eric, that what you do, you were just a natural at it? Partly, yes. Okay. Um, you know, to be honest, I didn't like to practice. Really? Uh, when, when I went to, like, my, my dad didn't know how to read or write music. Okay. So he wanted me to learn. So he brought me into, put me into drum school to learn how to read and write drum music. And I hated to practice. Okay. When I would practice and I was doing the stuff and then I was, like, listening to the rhythm, I was like, I already do that without even knowing what it was. I like, I already, I already do that. I mean, I wasn't trying to be cocky with it, but right. it's like, I, I knew that. So now with me knowing what it was then I, Oh, I can fly through this. And so then the next week I would go into and teach. I'm like, I fly through the thing. I'm like, Oh my God, you studied everything like that. Oh my God. I'm like, <laughs> okay. And when after five years you know it's like okay well i want to know how to play timpani i want to know how to do like orchestral percussion and the teacher said i can't teach you anymore because i don't i don't know how to do that wow so uh 
Yeah, it was like I think part of you know it was it was a natural thing to have, to have the ear. Yeah, but also my dad, you know, I mean, showing me the ropes and stuff like that. But I I think that he knew that I had something a little extra, and that's why he kind of did what he did. Wow, wow. Well, well, he saw it. He saw it in you at a young age, obviously. Yeah, I mean, he saw it, and my mom. I think early on, my mom hated it because okay. my mom didn't want me to get into the music business. Okay. Because, I mean, my mom and dad put together since they were like 17 years old. So she saw my dad, the beginnings, the highs, the lows, and everything like that. It's not an easy thing. You you, you, right. know, you know it. It's not an easy life. It's for, it's for the strong. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. I mean, you, you there's sacrifices you have to make. There's certain things you have to deal with certain trials and tribulations and um some people don't make it out you're right good so she was fearful of that for me right but at the same time it's like she she couldn't stop she couldn't stop the train you know what i mean <laughs> so uh she just accepted it after a while she didn't go to my first performance really she didn't go wow. she could she couldn't she couldn't do it well, so you beat me. You were five. I was 11 the first time I ever went to a nightclub. Yeah, yeah I was 11 years. I just graduated sixth grade. I had my uh, three-piece polyester suit from Kmart. My hair parted oh, in the middle. Oh, shit. Yeah, the part. Yeah, okay. and, my, and my brother was DJing, and he said, come on, let's go. I promised you that I would take you. And I said, all right. I graduated, and there I went, 11 years old, That's first dope. time. And I remember I heard uh, uh, first time for, he went in. He opened up the club, the manager was all there. He could only sneak me in when nobody was there, but I had to hide in the DJ booth. And I remember the very first song he played was uh, Ray Parker Jr. Still in the Groove. Oh, shit. That's when they were still playing funk. Back then, the, I, I give a lot of love to a lot of DJs because rap was so new still that they were still mixing live drummers. You right. Know? You know, we had to ride the record, you know. And my brother was a really good DJ. I remember, uh, uh, I mean, just songs like fucking Do Wah Diddy, Let's Work, Ray Parker Jr., Tom Brown, Thighs High, all, all that, that good stuff. shit. All that stuff. And the thing about it is that my, my dad was also, like, into that. So, and you know, besides his stuff and his music, he was doing covers of some of those songs. So, like oh, I wow. said, you know, we did we did Rise. We did uh, uh, Mr. Magic by Grover Washington Jr. Uh, uh, we would do a little part that will be, like, uh, the the thigh, the funkin' for Jamaica, yeah, thing like that. He you know he had his ear to the street like that, so that's why when like when that was being introduced with hip hop, as far as when the sampling years, I really felt connected. Like okay, then th th this is my this is really my sh my shit. Right, right. This is this is my shit. You know, you know your dad being a musician. Uh, um, this is I, I would like to ask this be because I've met like bands that played all live they could have like 10 or 12 guys in the band you know horn set and everything but when sampling came in they didn't take quite well to it because they were like well they're just sampling that's not even music mm -hmm. you know we played the music did your dad ever feel that way when when sampling came in see my father passed in 83 oh yes yeah, so wow. It was very, I mean, it was still um, a rapper's delight. Barely, you're fairly and new. It was very, very new, you know. Uh, but he was he was, he was gravitating to it. He heard me rapping Rapper's Delight. Okay. Uh, one day, you know. And, you know, that Rapper's Delight was like 15 minutes long, right? Yes, yes. You know, and if he was really cool and impressed people in school, you knew, like, the whole rap <laughs> from top to bottom, right? So... He heard me doing that one day in my room. So we're doing a show, and he tells me that he has, he has his band kick and beat, and he says, yo, do that, you do that thing what you were doing in the room, that 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 rapping thing, you know? There was no really no name name. Right. right. So at like 12 years old, I'm he, this band is kicking the beat, and I'm rhyming Rapper's Delight. That's dope on stage with him. Wow, wow. So it was like the 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 bridging of of the you know, and making this bridge because yes, what yes. happens eventually I get involved with hip hop. 
Wow, that's awesome. That's awesome. You know, uh, uh, is there anybody, uh, like right now in the stage of your career right now, is there anything else, Eric, that you still want to accomplish in music? For an example, I just want to continue to film, direct, and do this podcast. Musically, is there still anything out there like, you know what, Tone, I still want to produce, I still want to do this, I still want to tour, I still want to do, you know? Um, yeah. Um, I mean, I have a few projects that are going to be coming out this year. Okay. Uh, you know, it's an actual, like, hip-hop record, which will be, like, my first, like, hip-hop record I'm doing with a producer from the East Coast. Called, uh, his name is Stu Bangers. Okay. This, this project is going to uh, come out in, in, in April. I have another project also that's more on the Latin thing, actually going on on, on the cumbia vibe, and uh, and that's called El Bobo Negro. El Bobo Negro. So it's kind of like on that dark dungeon cumbia, as I call it, with like hip hop, deep bass beats and things like that. And then doing a tribute record to my dad, Jet Latin Jazz. Latin Jazz. So. I want to still want to make you know music like this. I've gotten into uh, film uh, out in Argentina where I was living for like eight years in Buenos really? Aires. Um, I got involved uh, in the industry out there and and started doing music for like one of the top series in in Argentina called El Marginal, and that's on Netflix. It's on some prison cartel. Ill, it's ill. It's really, it's real <laughs> ill. And then I also wrote a theme for another series out there and was nominated for like two awards out there. Like they're equivalent to like Golden Globe and wow. and an and, and Emmy kind of thing to be nominated being like the first uh, person outside of like Latin America, first person for the state to be nominated for that award. Wow. So getting into film and doing all that stuff is that's where i want to to go for me to be honest and the touring thing uh i still love to perform i still i still love it but uh i don't really want to be touring forever right right i i, I don't want to be like those guys that have been like i and i've seen them you know like the the og jazz guys that they play until they're like 99 you know I'm not trying to do that. I'm trying to be on a whole other different, you know, plane on that, on that, on that point. Yeah. You know, I, I, I want to go out on top when I can still perform it the way that I'm used to performing. Hell yeah. I don't want to be a shadow of myself and know that I'm a shadow of myself, but have to play because of. Right. That's why I'm trying to set things up now and do other things up now. So when I transition, it's a smooth transition, you know. Right. I want to make music forever, but I've been performing since five. I've been five years old. <laughs> you know? Awesome. So we're going to go ahead and press pause right there. We're going to come right back. I know you're going to give us a little bongo uh, music. Yeah, that's what I, I heard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to do that. You know what? I, and I want to know why you went to go stay in Argentina. And then I want to talk about your podcast. You got a Tony uh, Hawk story. Yeah. Okay. All right. And we got some other shit. So, and I'm gonna start drinking. So shit's about to get lit. So, oh, oh. so yeah. So we're gonna take a shot of some mezcal that was brought to me by my boy Reyes Kennel. Uh, where, where's it from? Durango. 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 Yeah. So, so we're gonna take some mezcal shots. So make sure you call somebody, take somebody, slap the shit out of somebody, let them know that Eric Bobo Cypress Hills in the motherfucking building, and we'll be back. Take somebody, slap the shit out of somebody. Let them know that Rodin Radio is live up in the Biatch. Radio. 
up guys? This is Danny with 310 Micheladas. We have our uh, classic 310 Michelada right here. Comes with two beers of your choice. We uh, prep it up with our own chamoy mix. And then um, comes with two beers, like I said, pineapple, uh, chamoy candy. This is our new 310 Dark Tropicana. This one right here comes with uh, pineapple chunks, our own mix. Of course, the two uh, pineapple rings and three shots of Hennessy. That's right, three shots of Hennessy. So we do give the option to infuse them with CBD or THC. Every five milligrams will be uh, $3 extra. And then for CBD, every five milligrams will be $5 extra. We do offer catering services. We do events, family gatherings, small parties, you name it. We also do deliver and we do pickup orders. Uh, make sure to follow us on Instagram, 310 Micheladas. from 110 South, straight down your mouth, with Tony A, the wizard, when rhodium radio's popping, the taco stays dripping and dropping, with John motherfucking pocket pussy out, and stir, you know she felt it, so stay ready, it's gonna be a hard act to swallow, so take your blue shoe and Spanish fly, and enjoy the groove.
This is your deal on Rodeo Radio. Pull your panties to the side and enjoy the ride. Until we get the whiskey. Welcome back, everybody, to Rodian Radio, episode 128. And I have here my uh, Micheladas from 310 Micheladas. My boy Danny brought him up, brought her to us, hooked us up. Shit is awesome. It, it's addicting. That's what it is. It's addicting. So if you guys want to get addicted, hit up 310 Micheladas, and you guys will get addicted to his Micheladas. Their shit, it's off the fucking hook. Harbor area in the motherfucking house, okay? And my boy, uh, 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 Marisco Aguirre, he uh, hooked us up with some ceviche, ceviche de camarón, ceviche de pescado. Hit him up. You guys saw his ad. If you guys didn't see it, rewind it. You'll see it during the break. But I uh, also want to give a shout out to my boy, Eric, from Eric's Reyes Kennel. I think I said it right. Did I say it right, Eric? El Reyes El Reyes Kennel. El Rey, he says it like white, El Rey's kennel. No, but anyways, he um, brought us some mezcal from Durango. So if I start drinking and I start saying a bunch of dumb shit, blame it on him, okay? He's responsible. So with that being said, Eric, thank you once again for being here. Uh, I don't want tonight to end, but we have some mezcal. You don't have to down it. I'm going to sip on my shit. Yeah, no, no. I, I'm going to sip too. Okay. I mean, I, I, it's like this. I mean, when you came on to the Green Thumb podcast, because I know that you don't smoke, but you endured two hours of heavy duty smoke. This all in your face, everything like that. I think Ezo might have been blowing it your way just, <laughs> just on purpose. You know, and, and you know, you took it like a champ. Like you. And Tony Hawk really like took it like a champ. I mean, you took it like a champ, true champ, right there. <laughs> you know, like a G. Like Tony Hawk, after a while, it was like you just saw the look on his face. Like, man, he's not gonna make it. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, but uh, yeah, it's uh, 
Yeah, it's great. You know, awesome, so brother. So I, I, so I got to take this, you know, yes. for you. To a long and prosperous life. Yeah, same. Damn. Oh, okay. <laughs> Damn. Oh, shit. Okay. That shit tastes like transmission hell, fluid. Hell, hell. <laughs> shit. This is oh. the kind of shit you rub on your ankle once it gets swollen. Mm, yeah, like, man. Like, Damn. It's got the power of Vipaparu. Yeah, I mean, fuck. Did, did, did you step on the plant yourself barefoot? Or something? <laughs> fuck. That motherfucker. Shit, Damn, man. man. Okay. I, I felt the, the hair coming out of my chest. Damn, yeah. I don't need any more, man. <laughs> shit. <laughs> oh, man. But I, I, I'll tell you what. Uh, uh, what would, what would they call Dr. Rita's? The, the, that, uh, the bean and, uh, and, um, He's on, we're, we're making us the drink? Yeah, the, the margarita. The margarita. Was, yeah. Oh, my God. Those, yeah. are, those are fucking off the hook, Yeah, bro. yeah, yeah. He, he, he's evil on that one. Yeah. And he learned that, you know, be real, he makes a good margarita, too. So I think he showed his own how to, how to fuck around and yeah, yeah. And, fuck and, people up. And then the weed mixed with the weed, uh, it was all good, bro. It was all fucking love. But I remember when I told B, I think I'm fucking high. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, I mean, when he came in and I saw him uh -huh. and I'm like, I, I, you know, I know when I know, I know B and when I see him with like that permagrin smile and everything does like, he's just happy. I'm like, oh, he's in. Yeah. He, yeah. Yeah. He was, he was, he was in. So, I mean, and that means he's having a good time. Yes. So he says, man, he, he was telling me, man, you gonna have a good time and you gonna have a good time. It's all right. Awesome, man. You know, it, it was funny because uh, when the podcast was over there, over there with you guys, I remember I looked at him and I was like, dude, I'm fucked up. I'm afraid to get up. He goes, me too. <laughs> I, yeah. It was all love. Brother. He told me, he said, yo, had I had like a few more shots, I wouldn't, I would have been stuck. I'm like, oh, shit. We drank I mean, a whole fucking bottle of tequila like this. You know, and the thing is, is like, I mean, not to say that he's not a drinker, but you know, he, it's not common that he's going to be just like, you know, down in it like that. So, man, you got him on a good one. Props to you yeah, man. doing that. Well, hopefully we could do it all again. Oh, boy. <laughs> 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 now, now, okay, now tell us, because you guys have a podcast, Dr. Green Thumb, every day, Monday through Friday, mm -hmm. from 2 to 4? Yeah, basically. 2 to 4. And I encourage you guys to like, subscribe, comment, whatever, donate, but tune in. Dr. Green Thumb podcast, Be Real TV, Monday through Friday, 2 to 4. Uh, it's uh, Be Real, E Zone, Eric. And C minus. C minus. That, I couldn't remember his name. Yeah. I, I, and the thing is, like, I mean, it was really, you know, like with the, with them three, and, you know, I, I was uh, coming, you know, and I'll be a guest every now and then. And, you know, B and I, back in the late 90s, we had a, a show on the radio called Soul Assassins Radio. Yes. And that was on the beat, uh, 92.3 The Beat. And basically, you know, it was just us like talking shit, really on the on the edge type of radio. Uh, had all the, you know, beat junkies and, you know, doing like mixing on the on on the thing and and it it was it was a great time, but it was funny and we would do skits and everything like that. So the podcast actually kind of for me is like touches of that so when i started like coming coming back i come back in town and everything you know the flow was just there so i just started like, kind of like jumping in and then uh, b says yo man just join us on the podcast you know what i mean and says that the people the people man they're tripping out when you come on i'm like all right well you know we'll see how it, we'll see how it goes yeah you know? and it's been it's been fun it's yeah, fun. yeah, most definitely. You know what? Uh, share with us a little bit um, of the when you get a chance the Tony Hawk story. You said that uh, something happened with him when he was a guest on your guys' show. All right, all right. Well, basically, you know, uh, we have props out to our 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 uh, peeps out there that come into the chat room, and we call them the the insane asylum, <laughs> and. Uh, the ones that are really, really demented. We call them the 5150s. But anyway, <laughs> uh, B has a thing like, you know, we get want to get a guest on the show. You wave them, you know. So 
The Insane Asylum kind of waved uh, Tony Hawk because B did a sh- uh, 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 a spot on something that Tony Hawk had. Yeah. And then he said, yo, man, you need to come on to the podcast. So they waved him and got him to come on to the show. Now, Tony Hawk is, I think that he's a low-key stoner. Like, he's not like outwardly stoner. Maybe, he's, you know, does it at night to rest <laughs> and go to sleep. Yeah. You know, so he did not smoke. Okay. But for two hours, he was in the just most cloudiest smoke <laughs> ever. And you see his face turn red. You see his eyes turn red. You see his hair start to go out of place. <laughs> this shit was just getting real bad for him. You know what I mean? So finally, you know, when he leaves, he has to pull over. He says he didn't get down the block. Really? He said he had to pull over and he stayed there for like 45 minutes. He's telling this story on another podcast. Oh, shit. Because they're like saying, how'd you do it, man? Oh, my God. We didn't know that you really smoked weed. And they were asking him, like, how did he deal with being on the podcast with Be Real and smoking like that? I mean, because there's times that, you know, you know, you can see on the screen that it's so smoky <laughs> on the screen, you know. It's like it's not a filter. It's not that's a fog real, machine. That's real, that's real deal shit, right? You know. So he was in the midst of all of that, and then you know, his own and few of us would kind of like blow smoke Tony Hawk's way, you know, just for shits and giggles. You know, <laughs> and yeah, so uh, yeah, he got kind of like you know, he got stoned, but he had a good time. That's good. That's all you that know? matters. He, you know, so I, I'm sure he'll come back again. Awesome. Now, now let, let me ask you this, Bobo. You being in the podcast uh, with being everybody, what was one of your most memorable guests that you've had on the show? I'm sure you probably had multiples. Uh, there's been multiples, but, you know, one person that I enjoy when he comes on to the show is the Godfather. He was a wrestler from the WWE. Okay. Uh, he also, you know, before he was the Godfather, he was uh, uh, Papa Shango, you know, all the WWE wrestler, like, and at times like Hulk Hogan and Undertaker and, and all that shit, The Rock, all that. And he is just wild and he's got some crazy ass stories. And just, you know, the thing is when you're doing a podcast, you know, you don't want people to just like relax and just be themselves and just chill out and just, you know, talk. And he he really feels himself, you know, like as far as like just letting go and just like, you know, sharing his experiences and saying some crazy stories, especially like stuff in the WWE and, and everything like that. So he's been, a, he's been a dope guest. Okay. Now you, you don't have to say no names, but have you ever had those guests that you just can't crack them? Everything's yes, no, mm, maybe. Um, you know, I, they told me that it was one person. I'm trying to remember the name. I wasn't there. Uh-huh. But it was like it was real boring. It's like when you have to do an interview and you and you have to pull yes the answers and everything from from the person. It doesn't make it fun, you know. And then you say, "Well, tell me about this." Well, you know, it's just like this, and then that's going to be the answer, and you know, and that's all they're giving you. You know, it becomes very frustrating. So uh, I think that they cut that interview short, but. Uh, yeah, I mean, there are people that are like that. That just, they just not interesting to, to interview. To an interview. <laughs> They're just not interesting. Yeah, maybe. You know, it's funny because I've had guys here that, uh, that man, when are you going to get me on? When are you going to get me on? I get them on. So I ask them a question, and like you said, you have to pull, and they're like, "Yeah, maybe. I don't know. Probably." And I'm just like, <laughs> yeah, I'm just like, okay. I, I, during the break, I, I've had to say, little, you got to give me a little bit more, bro. Or I'm going to cut this shit short. All right. We go back live. Same old shit. I'm falling asleep up in this motherfucker. Yeah. But but, but keep in mind, I, I always tell people, bro, promote yourself. Promote yourself. You got at least about a thousand people watching you. Mm-hmm. Promote yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, but I guess they don't feel the need to. So. Well, you know, not... <laughs> Not everybody is either A, comfortable, or B, knows how, you know, to deal with the interview kind of thing. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's, you know, you can rap and go in front of a mic and, you know, go in the studio, but that doesn't mean that when you go onto the stage, you're able to rock the house because right. there's, a different, there's a different animal. Right. So 
you know, some, some, there's some people that get interviewed and it's like, it's the worst interview ever because they just don't know how to speak or how to speak uh, on themselves or how to promote themselves or whatever. And it's just like, you don't want to hear that. You know, it's that their time to be able to promote their shit and, and say what they want to say and right. say what they need to say. And somebody they just, they just don't know. So it's like pulling teeth. Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, at the, at the same time, you know, I mean, in this platform, you know, we, you know, it's the talk and, you know, put stuff on the, on, out on the table and stuff and, and promote your stuff. Yeah. But I, I imagine even as an interviewer, if you have to like pull out the things or, answer the question for them so to think you can lead them to answer it's like right right you know what i mean I, I, am i correct did you guys have mike tyson on there mike tyson was in the smoke box okay uh that's the other show when they're in the when they're in the smoke box car yeah. and they're just blazing it out so yeah he was on there uh i don't remember if he was on the green thumb show uh the podcast but he was definitely in the smoke box. Okay, okay. You know, uh, uh, one of my favorite podcasts to watch is uh, uh, Joe Rogan. Mm -hmm. I, I like jo uh, Joe Rogan. You know, he just, well, it's, I think I, li I used to listen to him before he went to Spotify. Mm -hmm. More when he would have like Alex Jones and a bunch of other crazy other dudes and shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I like that Conspiracy shit. Conspiracy theorists. And yes, right? and I saw B on there. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and I saw uh, Joe Rogan on his smoke box, mm -hmm. you know. But um, there was this one guy that we were trying to get on here. And we had emailed, I guess, like his manager or whatever. And uh, uh, they said that they were interested. And uh, the fool ended up going to, to jail, like literally like days after. Wow. Yeah, that was uh, Ron Jeremy. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> that guy. <laughs> yeah. You bro. know what I mean? And, and let me tell you why I wanted to get him because I saw, well, I read an article where I guess he gave like an interview mm -hmm. and I was reading what the, the person was asking him. He was answering that if I'm correct, he said he knew Jim Morrison. That's what he said. And I'm a big, huge Doors fan. So I wanted to bring him on and talk music. You know, I didn't give a shit about that porn shit. They would have came up regardless, but right. his ass ended up going to fucking jail. You shit. Know? Well, it's a funny thing with about Ron Jeremy. He, uh, when we did Soul Assassins Radio, uh, somebody brought him up to the show. No shit. And so, you know, we're just talking and whatnot. And then after after the show, you know, our our thing would just would go down to where the cars are at and, you know, smoke smoke a little bit before leaving home. So we're all down there and I remember I was talking with Ron Jeremy. I told this this story on the podcast. Yeah. And I'm talking to him and like saying, Yo, you know, Man, it's crazy, man. He was like on, you know, all you know, on this porn shit and whatever like this. And I'm not paying attention to him. I'm just like in my moment. And all of a sudden I hear <sighs> He starts snoring, he starts sleeping. No shit. I'm talking to the fool and he starts he starts like sleeping on me. <laughs> you know, and I'm like looking, I'm like, what the fuck? I look over at B, I said, Could you believe this motherfucker's like sleeping? No, like <laughs> narcoleptic like a motherfucker you know what i mean and i mean i was like really like my you know you know not like i was like fan but fan and out but i was like making a point you know yeah and yeah he just went to sleep man that fool so you know i hope he's getting you know if he's in jail i hope he's getting his rest yeah exactly <laughs> let, let me tell you a quick story since we're talking about ron jeremy uh, um me and my boy dj thorough DJ uh, from, from Harlem flew out here. He was DJ for Raekwon at the House of Blues mm -hmm. when it was still open. Across the street from the House of Blues, I guess down the street somewhere, there was like this fancy little restaurant where everybody eats like after hours. So we were eating. And behind me, well, my boy Thoro's right here. And he points, he goes, look at that guy right there. And I go, who? I turn around, I'm fucked up, I'm faded. He goes, that guy right there. And I go, what dude, bro? He goes, the guy with the big one. And I said, the guy with the big one, what the fuck? So I turned around, it was Ron Jeremy. So I was like, oh, all right. And then I, th I thought to myself, fuck, let me go sit down and talk to him. So I picked up my plate and I went out and sat down next to him. And I was like, hey, how you doing, man? I know who you are. And he goes, oh, you do? And I go, yeah, you're Ron Jeremy. Check us out, bro. Uh, bro, finish up your plate. And after that, we're going to go outside. We're going to take a picture. He goes, oh, okay. And I said, you're all right. He goes, yeah, I thought you were somebody else. 
I don't know if somebody was looking for his ass or what, you know? <laughs> and I said, no, I just want a picture. He goes, okay, can you pay for my meal? And I said, yeah, okay, you want anything else? He goes, no, but I could take some pie to go home. Like, all right, give him a slice of pie or whatever. <laughs> Let me tell you how this guy was dressed. The motherfucker had a Crocs barefooted, okay? And uh, uh, he had high water tight sweats, camel toe. He had camel toe? He had a camel toe or cow tongue, however you want to call it. <laughs> <laughs> a shirt with a hole in it. And we went outside and, we, you know, I, I grabbed his hand. We took a picture. Then my homeboy says, hey, man, you grabbed his hand? And I was like, now you fucking tell. I'm fucking buzzed, bro. I don't care. So then I go, let's take another picture. I put my arm around him. And then two white girls walk out of that restaurant and they're looking down at him like this. And you can hear him. He don't look that big. And he looks at me while we're taking the picture. And he goes, that's what they all say. <laughs> that motherfucker, man. <laughs> He looked, like, he looked like a fat ass cat, bro. That's what he looks like. Like a man, fat ass cat. Man, this was, yeah, it's roughneck style, man. <laughs> you know, he might have been the shit in the 70s, but, you know, you can't bring that shit around here no more. Remember a cat in the hat by, what was it, Mike Myers? Was that him, Mike Myers? Yeah, that's what he looked like. He looked like a fat ass cat. But, hey, he took a picture with me. I still got the damn picture, so. But I'm not going to post that motherfucker. He's in jail right now. No, no, don't, don't do that, you know. <laughs> you know, I mean. He would always, I would hear stories, he would always be over at the, the Rainbow Bar and Grill and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he just was, you know, not too, not too nice, you know what I mean, to, to staff there from what I hear. Really? You know, I'm yeah. not, I'm, you know, I'm not, you know, saying nothing because I was not there, didn't know, but, right. you know, he, he's in jail where he's at for a reason, but yeah. he did something. Yeah, or else he wouldn't be in jail. He was yes, he's yeah. So, <laughs> but how in the fuck we get into Ron Jeremy? It's, it's this unlet it kicking. You brought, you, you brought him up. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I'm not responsible. <laughs> him, him, him. He, he brought the unlet it. So, uh, transmission oil, fluid. So, but it's actually starting to get pretty good. It's starting to get pretty good. So I'm halfway through that one. But uh, okay, moving over from J Ron Jeremy. <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> I, and I saw his ass in Colorado, uh, but um, yeah, he, I think he was wearing the same shit. Ca camel yeah, toe. That but. sounds right. It's you know, he, he had me at the Crocs. <laughs> I hate those motherfuckers. <laughs> <laughs> That's some Friday. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that they're you know comfortable or whatnot, you know, and everything, but I, I don't know, man. They just don't look right, man. They don't I mean, look right. They don't look right, you know. <laughs> I'd rather have some old fashioned like chanclas, you know? Yeah, or some fluffles or something. You know, pantufla, something like that, you know? And, but um, croc, nah. Croc, that shit yeah, looks like your fucking pass. feet was be sweating fucking nasty if you took them off. Yeah, hell yeah, man. Hell your feet yeah. looking like pig's feet and shit. Yeah, but, man. <laughs> okay, okay, now. Um, I even forgot what the fuck I was even going to talk about now. Damn, Bobo. See, see what happens? No, but we're starting to get there. We're, it's almost there. We're almost there. <laughs> so, but, um, okay. Uh, what, what made you move to Argentina? You were there seven, eight years, you said? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, you know, I was uh, uh, I was in a relationship uh, before then, and I had a, a, a kid. Okay. I have I have my son. And uh, uh, the mo his mom is uh, from... Argentina. Okay. So uh, upon them moving back, I was like, you know, well, I, you know, need to be over there. So you know, to help raise him, even though I wasn't with, you know, his mom. So upon being there, you know, I mean, that was a, a crazy thing because, you know, I was away from everything and yeah. all my friends and everything like that, and then also away from the band. So. It's not every it's not every band you can say, Hey, you know, by the way, I'm gonna be um staying out uh South America like like, you know, fifteen hours flight away, you know, but when you need me, you know, just let me know, you know, I'll be back, you know. And it was kinda like that. You know, so it was like when it was time for tour, I would meet the guys out in Europe and we're coming from different directions, boom, wow. you know, and everything like that. So it was it was but I, you know, we still kept it going, but I was out there for that time. And then during that time, that's when I got, you know, introduced to some people there in the music and in film industry. And I got hooked up with the, one of the top guys out there. His name is uh, Sebastian Ortega. And, um, 
he had the show and he was a big Beastie Boy and Cypress Hill fan and he was tripping out on the fact that I was out there and so we just connected and then he says I would like you to do some music for you know my next project said, yeah sure no problem and then that turned into you know I want you to do the theme song and I did the theme song and I actually had Send Dog you know do a rhyme over it and it's not really a hip hop song at all okay but uh, it it the 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 show uh, was called uh, Un Un Gallo para Escolapio, and it was the number one show out there in Argentina, and it was on TNT Latin America and everything like that, and then it got nominated for all these fucking awards. Wow! Like about 13, 14, 15 awards, and my song was one of the ones that were nominated. And I tripped the fuck out because, like, this is actually the first time I've written a, a theme song wow. to anything, to an, like a novella or miniseries. Yeah. And it's nominated for, you know, an award. I didn't win the award, but the the show won about a good nine awards. So you was hearing my song all night, you know. So to me, that was a big win yeah. for me and for me to be there. Uh, so... Then, then got involved in, this, in another TV series with like a number one uh, show out there, and that that's on Netflix and everything. And so I was able to kind of like live out the the dream of doing music for a film. So uh, then the same company uh, starts to produce the the movie L.A. Originals. Oh yeah, and I did the original music for that. Awesome, awesome. L.A. Originals, that's the cartoon? Yeah, that's uh, a cartoon, Esteban. and uh, Esteban Oreo. So I did the original music for, for that. Now, I, I had seen a while back, um, you know, and I rarely, rarely ever go on Facebook. I'll post and I'll get the fuck out. Like, even though I'm an older cat, I just feel like Facebook is like for older people, you know. I, I'm more active on Instagram than I do than I, on Facebook. But the reason why I bring that is because I saw that there was a, a, a page or something promoting a Cypress Hill documentary. Mm -hmm. can, can you fill us in a little bit about that? Has, has, has that been in the works? Is there a date? Yeah, or? yeah, yeah. We're, uh, there is not a date, but um, there's a bunch I can't really, really say. But I mean, we have, we, there is some updates, and I will say that it is happening. Okay. Cypress Hill documentary is happening. It was for oh. sure. Um, I don't know whether it's going to be something that's going to be a movie documentary or something in parts. Okay. All of that stuff is being discussed, but um, it's going to involve all the members. Mugs will be there every, you know, it's going to tell the full story. Awesome. Awesome. I'm pretty sure that's, well, I'm sure that's something we've all been, because I'm a documentary guy. I love mm -hmm. fucking watching documentaries, you mm -hmm. know? And uh, when I heard that there was going to be one, I was like, I need to watch that shit because yeah. I was there when Cypress Hill was taken off. You know, I, yeah. I seen it, you know, people my age seen that shit. We lived through it. Uh, I mean, you know, it's funny that when you said that about his voice, when you said, is this guy really rapping like that? Because the only other person that I thought that about was when I first heard Easy e mm. Steve Yano had played the demo of LA is the place, Fat Girl on my jock and uh, Boys in the Hood. And he said, what do you think about that song? And I thought, I thought it was cool. Now keep in mind, you got Cube, you got Dre, and you got Easy at the Rodium Swamp meet, you know, and Steve Stan. Steve's playing it for me. He says, I need you guys to listen to what he says because he's a DJ. I didn't know, I knew who Dr. Dre was. I just saw him like a mega star because he was from the world-class wrecking crew. I didn't know who O'Shea was and who Eric was, you know? And then uh, they play, uh, LA is the place, and then Black Girl on my jock. And I was like, that's, that's cool. You know, I'm still thinking Wrecking Crew because of Dr. Dre. But when they played Boys in the Hood and I heard the cutting and the scratching, I said, who in the hell is that? That guy's voice is weird. I go, but it's catchy. And I remember that's when the crowd were coming in. What's that? What, what's that? What's that? And then Steve, a Japanese guy from the city of Whittier, would look at, Steve, would look at Dre and goes, I'm telling you guys, that's your song. And then that's when they decided to go into that whole, you know, what they would call back then street rap, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, direction steve yano he definitely had an ear man he, he had a, he had an ear he was always cool cool with me and but i just noticed that he had an ear 
And for the times that I did get a chance to just like rap with him, you know, about music, you know, he kn he knew his shit. Yeah, he, he did. definitely he definitely knew his shit. So yeah, well, yeah I'm definitely uh, uh, thankful to have been a little part of you know what he what he, what he was going on had going on with Scandalous. Yeah, and, and that's why Eric, that's why I'm, I'm very thankful that you're here because Steve sold out the Rodium Swami, and that's why I figured let me carry on his legacy and call it Rodium Radio. You know, uh, uh, to give independent artists or, or major artists an opportunity to uh, share their story, share their voice, you know, and uh, promote whatever they have. Shine, I like to shine light on people. That's mm -hmm. what I like to do. Uh, now, can, can you share a little bit more? I know you kind of touched on it before we went to break on some of the things that you have coming out this year once again, for the, so that people can be looking out for it. Okay. Uh, first up to bat, um, have an album coming out in April with. Uh, my man Stu Bangers, he's from the East Coast. He's a dope underground producer, you know, coming up. And he, he's worked with, you know, the Jedi Mind Tricks, Ill Bill, you know, uh, Vinnie Paz, uh, Sick Jack, and uh, Sean Price. And uh, our album is called Empires, and it's coming out in April. And the uh, track list and the people that will be on it will be announcing all of that soon. Uh, but it's it's definitely it's it's grimy, and um, it's it's definitely a snapshot of the year that we just went through, and something I think it's important to document, yeah, and just to acknowledge that you know this is this was something really serious that we've all had to deal with yeah. from you know the politics part of it to the pandemic part of it to you know everything, yeah. so. Uh, uh, that's going to be coming out in April. Then uh, another record, uh, which is on the Latin side, and that's uh, called El Bobo Negro. That's going to come out later on in the year. And probably the last half of the year uh, will be the tribute album to my dad, which will be me performing some of his music. And uh, I haven't played his music since uh, I had broken up the Latin jazz band in like 90... 1990 so oh, i haven't played my father's music since then so this is going to be like a real big full circle yeah for me you, you know uh, uh this may be a silly question but i'm going to ask it for the fans sake when hopefully hopefully you know when this pandemic ends and i'm speaking about the the record uh dedicated if you will to your father would you be performing that stuff yes okay yes you know that that stuff has to be has to be out there and perform. Yeah. The, 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 this, the, the album Empires is, is I, I think it's something that, I mean, for the artists that are on the record, you know, should they per, want to perform it, they'll, you know, perform their songs, they can do it. It's not something that I would be going out on the road to do, but it's gonna be something visual as far as a lot of videos, a lot of things to it is gonna be on another side, not, not so much like on the performance side. Uh, the other projects, uh, I'm looking to perform and do those things live. I mean, I, I, you know, I need to take it to the stage. Yeah, yeah. I definitely, I definitely want to attend those type of shows because once again, I love music. I love you as a percussionist. You know, I, your music, your your production, everything, man. I love to see you play, especially because, like I said, I compared you to two of my DJ DJ heroes. Outside of those two guys on the turntables, you were the next guy that I was like, wow. And believe me, everybody that knows me as a producer, as a DJ, as a director, as a podcaster, knows that there are several people that I brag about, and you're always one of them. Damn. You're always one of them, and you probably never knew it because it's no. been years since I've talked to you. Yeah. The 90s. I mean, it's, yeah, it's been that long. And I tell you, I mean, all, you know, for, 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 for me, all I've wanted to do is just kind of like, I say, you know, just do play my part in, in, in the music and and to be able to be surrounded by you know talented musicians and producers yeah. and everything like that you know and it's crazy because like you know you brought up times that like man i i mean there's so much that's a blur to me i mean i have i've corrupted my mind a little bit too much <laughs> but uh you know those, those those were the beginnings i mean the Steve Yano and Scandalous days, oh, that that was 
a true beginning and a bridge into what I'm doing now. So it's a, you know, as as well and as important as, you know, the Latin, my Latin jazz years was that I, you know, I can't go, you know, talk about now without, you know, right. talking about that part, you know, and, and, and Scandalous Records and the studio right there in Alhambra on that little, the little side street. And, yeah. You know, being there with uh, the Juice Electric Wire. Yep. You know, uh, you know, Ernie you Ernie G, my- you know, all of them, you know, yeah. being right there. And so that was a true, true beginning, you know, so. Uh, Did you ever eat Mexican food from that little restaurant at the corner? There used to be a, yeah, yeah right there. Yeah. Like, that fucking place was the fucking yeah. I don't even know if it's still there. But I hope my home, my homeboy still has the picture up. My boy, they call his name is Mario Charrias. He calls himself the Scandalous Photographer after Steve's record label. Uh, he has pictures of you still at the Scandalous. Get the fuck out. No, I'm serious. He does. He, this this guy is like everything. I would love to. I would love to see that shit. Yeah. Whipper. So Mario, if you're watching, uh, get at Bobo or get at me, and then I'll send it to him. Young Whipper. I was young Whipper Snapper back then. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, man. So other than that, uh, you know, Bobo, I don't know what else to ask you, but I want to keep hanging out with you, man. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, first of all, you guys, you have a great setup. I mean, I can ask you about, I mean, I, I can, I noticed that you're a heavy duty Star Wars. I love Star and, Wars. And, and superhero fan. That's Thor's hammer right there. Yeah, Thor's hammer. There, there's Chucky right there. You got the. Horror movies, you know, stripper. You know, the strip. Yeah, Barbie I like strip clubs. Okay, I got you. Oh, you know, when I, when, when I saw you last, uh, in it Long wasn't Beach. At, it wasn't at the strip club. Okay. But <laughs> <laughs> it was in the nineties. Do you remember Fritz in Long Beach? Yeah. I saw you there too. You had walked it back in the days. There was this one Italian girl that she used to make her booty cheese clap. That motherfucker looked like elephant ears. Like I'm serious, bro. And you were right there making it rain before they called them make it not money plan. <laughs> That's a long time ago. In, long a, gal- time ago. in a galaxy far, 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 far away. away. <laughs> And the force was with you strong. Yo, yeah, man. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. That, that, all those things, all those experiences led me to not going and spending my money like that. Yes, yes. No. You, you know, one thing, look, we used to go deep to these strip clubs with the homies right here from the neighborhood. And I swear to God, as soon as one of the homies got fucking drunk, he swore to God that he was going to take one of those strippers home. And I go, bro, no, bro, she likes me. I'm going to wait outside for her. She's going to come out, bro. She took your fucking money. No, no, she was grinding on me. She was breathing on me. I know she's going to come out. She does that to everybody, bro. She does that to her. No, no, but she told me she'll wait for me. I, every, every time I took a fucking dude to the strip club, he swore to God he's going to take one of those girls home. Those girls never fucking came out. They did their job. They got paid. And you didn't get laid. So that's it. It's, you know, it is. And some people, you, you live and you learn. Some people, they don't learn you know yeah but uh yeah no i don't know they're giving up the money like that that's no 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 hell no i can't i can know well i i've never paid for a, like a lap dance or whatever never you know i i it just wasn't my thing you know what we used, we used to do me and my homies used to go to fritz get a fucking table order hot wings pictures of beer and discuss bits like street business you gonna dance no you want to no I, I told you no. After a while, they fucking called the manager. Hey, are you guys going to get in? We just want to drink beer and eat hot wings. That's it, bro. Mm. But they used to get mad because we didn't want to look at Nalga. Right. right you know? no. So it was just a hangout place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, even though nobody believed me, but we would just used to go hang out. Yeah. And occasionally we get a sneak peek and we look at somebody's chicoloso, but, you know. <laughs> It happens, eh? <laughs> it happens. <laughs> Sneak peek behind the scenes. Back door action. Por el callejón. Anyways, um, let me fucking stop, bro. This, it's this guy, it's Eric. This girl, man. That's it. Eric. Eric. That's yeah, it. this guy from Durango. Yeah. I blame Durango. Okay. <laughs> hey, that guy right there, I'm going to tell you something about him. The baddest bullies, the baddest bullies. I'm going to say West Coast right now, okay? The baddest bullies, the dogs, okay? He has like the Rolls Royce of dogs. Really? Yes. So if you're into that, talk to that man. Okay. Good so, to know. Yeah. If you want him on uh, videos, that's the man. Reyes Kennels. So, and if you guys want some unleaded transmission oil, <laughs> hit him up. All right. Okay. <laughs> good to know. Are we good on gas? <laughs> <laughs> this shit will melt your liver. So, man. so yeah. uh, 
Okay, let me ask you a quick question, Bobo. What was one of the best movies you've seen in a long time? I don't know, recently or last year? One of the best movies. I'll give you mine. Okay. Bohemian Rhapsody. Uh, the story of uh, Queen Freddie Queen. Mercury. Okay. Uh, you want to, okay. It, it was, it didn't come out recently, but I just saw it recently. And I dug it. Apocalypto. Apocalypto's fucking dope. I'm really, I'm kind of slow with the movie things. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm kind of slow, you know, uh, but I recently saw that and I really dug that mo a movie. I know it was a long movie, but it kind of like flew by to me because it was like that interesting. Uh, I've been more on the documentary thing. I've been more, you know, getting on that. I saw the Bee Gees documentary. That was dope. You know, that was dope. Uh, there's a Duran Duran documentary you can check out. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm liking more than that. I want to see some really good music, music documentary things. That's I, I want. I'm looking for more of that. Now, the one that I always brag about here, uh, that you watched, um, Quincy Jones documentary. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. I love that one. That was a good one. That one right now is probably my favorite. I watched uh, Jimmy Iovine, Dr. Dre documentary, and I'm gonna say something, okay? I love Dr. Dre. I met him in the 80s at the Swamp Meet through Steve Yano. Mm -hmm. Everybody that I've met, including yourself, and I always give credit where credit is due to me, rest in peace, I met through Steve. Mm -hmm. like, I'm not gonna sit here and say, oh yeah, and I knew that for, I, no, yeah. it all came through him. And um, like, one thing I would say about that documentary was that when Steve, right before Steve passed away, they called them and asked them because Steve was the guy that would film everything at audio achievements here in the city of Torrance. He recorded Mix Master Spade, Tali T, when they did All in the Same Gang, when, when Easy E was dropping lyrics, um, uh, JJ Fad, everything. He recorded everything. So they called him Steve. Steve, you used to have that film from, you know, 30 something years ago? Yeah. Okay, cool. Bring it down. Okay. Brought it down. A couple of days later, he passed away. He fell from a two story ladder, pretty much broke his neck. And I'm not going to go into details because I don't want to get emotional. Because I love that guy and I've been knowing that guy since I've been 11 years old. And um, so it fucked me up, you know. And um, a year later, the fucking documentary comes out and uh, Steve's, Steve's wife, Susan, calls me and tells me, Tony, did, did you see it? And I go like, yeah. And he goes, doesn't it make it seem like, you know, they used all the old footage that they used in that documentary was Steve Yano's and they never received one penny. Mm. And I said, uh, you, did you sign anything? Did you get paid? And she said, no. And I go, well, what did you get? She goes, I got an email, but the lady doesn't respond. And I go, well, it's already out. It's too late. It's too late. They just took the footage and that he was saving. And, um, and I don't want to paint an ugly picture of Dre. I, I really do not. But that was the true story. And that's why it was hard for me to enjoy Mm -hmm. that documentary because once again I've known them for for many many years and that was their footage and there would have no been no documentary if it wasn't for that old footage because whenever they showed uh Easy E and my boy Crazy D and Dr. Dre behind the board and all that stuff that was all of his stuff the world would not have ever seen it if it wasn't for Steve who had shot that footage back then and uh, they never even got their footage back so you know I mean it's it's fucked up because you know in this business there's a lot of sharks yeah there's a lot of sharks out there and you know with something as precious as that you know when you you know when you need something oh you're going to be so nice and everything like that to get what you want and when you get it and then you use it then it's like okay you got it now you don't have to worry about it no more you don't have to worry about contacting this person whatever because you got what you wanted Right. Because you weren't you weren't sincere about it. You're doing things and not really having the good intentions of 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 of, of doing the right thing. Yeah. You know what I mean? And yeah, you can tell the story and people would be interested to tell the story, but it it, it I mean, if it's not full and it's not all the way a hundred percent, then you know Yeah. And to be honest, in, in some ways, I kind of felt like that uh, with the uh, the Beastie Boy documentary. 
because there was a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of stuff that was not told and was not said and was not, you know, even mentioned or and or focused on. And, you know, yes, they, you know, they are giants and everything like that and, yeah. and, and what they did. But, you know, you know, teamwork makes the dream work. Yeah. You know, and they couldn't have made the heights that they did without the team that they had. And, you know, sometimes you got to acknowledge that just to give an acknowledgement, you know what I mean? The people that have been there. So I, I, I understand exactly what you, what you, what you're saying. Like with the, with the Cypress documentary, I mean, we have to tell the story yeah, and we have to tell the story and do it in the right way. And maybe that's why it's, things have taken as long as it has, because, you know, there could be some people that want to tell a story in one way. Some people that want to tell a story another way because they see it and, you know. Right. But there is only one way, and it's the way that things happened. Right. You know, and you got to tell the story right or don't tell it at all. Yeah, I agree. You know, I'm directing right now a Chicano rap documentary, and I, I already did the, the Rodeo Mixtape documentary because I wanted to tell. I wanted Steviano's name to live on because I do believe that his stand at the Swami was a huge cornerstone uh, to West Coast, you know, hip hop. Because uh, once again, in and I'm going to quote uh, Arabian Prince, a uh, former member of NWA. He said this, before uh, NWA, before NWA ever like had their music out, it was on the Rodian mixtapes first. Mm -hmm. That's what he, that's what he said, and it's the truth. That's how they used to test. You know, if people liked it, people bought it, then let's go with that. You know, that that type of shit. And so what I'm doing, I'm doing the Chicano rap documentary. I started the GoFundMe, and I only asked for fifteen thousand, honestly, just to buy new equipment, and we did that. But now we're like almost at twenty. People are still giving because they still believe in this project because they like the the first project that I've done. Now, uh, COVID has fucked a lot of things up because a lot of people don't want to do interviews right now. They don't want to come out. And I get it. I understand that. So we kind of slowed things down. But I'll tell you what, by the time I'm done with this documentary, I'm going to knock it out the motherfucking ballpark because now I know what I'm doing. I almost feel like I experiment with the first one, but the first one took me one year to film, took me one year to edit. And when it came out, I got not one negative response. One heavy hitter, and I'm going to go ahead and quote him. His, his name is uh, Rashidi Harper. He's Dre's cameraman. And he told me like this, if you release this in film festivals, you, you are most likely 85% going to win. That's what he said. And uh, he did the Serena Williams, the, the Williams sisters documentary, did many documentaries. He said, you're about 85% sure you're going to win. And then fucking COVID hit and we didn't, we didn't go anywhere. You know, it's kind of like when Esteban was here, mm -hmm. COVID hit, they were supposed to host the, the I guess, uh, a film festival. Well, well, that was the thing that uh, Sundance, uh, Sundance. Uh, Sun, you know, the the LA original is supposed to be over at Sundance, and it's a big, you know, it's a big opportunity and a big thing. And then all of a sudden, COVID hit, and you know, that opportunity, you know, goes mm -hmm. goes away. You know, I mean, the film came out and people loved it, liked it and everything like that, but you know, it could have reached and done more had you know we not had you know right. the, the pandemic i mean we were about to go start our road thing and then it just knocked that out you know yeah. so everything got knocked out i mean our industry the music industry got hit so bad and we're the last ones that are gonna really come out and be doing anything because we play in front of people yeah you know we don't we don't you know we can do live streaming all day you know and everything <laughs> like that but our thing is the stage. Our thing is to be in front of people yeah. and, you know, touring and that's, you know, big sound, big stage, you know? So, you know, uh, I mean, we're going to get back to it, but I think that this has all shown us a real big lesson and it's been a real big reset. Yeah. And a lot of people have had to get their hustle on in different ways and be real creative with it, you yeah. know? And I, I applaud those that have been able to do that. Not, a lot of people have, you know, been able to make that transition, you know, without getting help or getting any kind of assistance. You yeah. know what I mean? So we just got to not take this thing for granted, you know, and just, 
you know, try try to go forward and, and try to be creative in this time because a lot of things are going to come out of this. Yes. I mean, so many things. I mean, what came out of the last pandemic that happened? The Roaring Twenties. And the Roaring Twenties started, boom, something completely new and revolutionary. That's that's right. what we got. That's what we got to do. Well, you know what? Uh, one thing that I've done, uh, I had homies that have told me, "Hey, you know what? You know, what? I'm gonna let this pandemic pass, and uh, I'll get busy later on." It's been a fucking year, bro. And you wasted a whole fucking year. What I've been doing, I've been hustling. I've been sitting here twice a week. I know you can do it five times a week. Twice, what? Well, actually, three times with, with Freaky Tales. Three times a week and interviewing. And then Freaky Tales fucking telling ghost stories and shit. Mm. You know, se me pareció el pinche diablo mm. type of stories. I love that shit because I love horror movies. Mm. You know, but um, shit, if you got any horror movies, I'll invite you to Freaky Tales too, brother. Man, yeah, I, I do. I do. I do. I mean, like I said, we, me and my girl, we watched, uh, we watched a lot of murder shit and we try to find out those, those um, ill horror movies. <laughs> so even some of those B horror movies that be like on. Yes. On. Uh, Pluto or Tubi or those kind of like obscure shits like that. Yeah. You know, evil lives here and you know, that kind of, you know, ill shit. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah, exactly. Fuck it. Let's watch it. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. Eric, uh, possibly one of your favorite horror movies. Well, oh, can, can I ask a girl real quick? What's one yeah, of hers? Yeah, yeah. What's one of yours? Ta first one that comes to your mind. Uh, probably the evil dead. The evil dead. Yeah. The old school one. The yeah. The old school one. Fuck. The old school and the evil dead well you know as far as a horror thing the thing that will still like kind of creep me out you know exorcist was oh, always fuck. was always one and, and i saw that late i saw that in first time I, in high school all all my friends they'd already seen it i went to a catholic ball boys high school and in theology class they showed the exorcist what the what that makes what kind of sense does that fucking make i was about to say time out like seriously yeah yeah in theology class i remember i said we we're watching the exorcist okay i'm gonna pour me another shot while you, while you... i did uh, half half okay, does okay, i have okay uh, okay okay yeah, half. Half. okay let's let's keep it pushing yeah <laughs> okay so you were... I gotta watch it i gotta watch this guy right here <laughs> in theology that's half yeah uh, it, it, yeah, yeah, the, the glass is halfway full. Okay. Okay. All right. Fuck. Okay. It's getting good. Yeah. So now. <laughs> so, yeah, I went to Catholic All Boys High School. I went to Cathedral High School, which is the first uh, Catholic Archdiocese school in Los Angeles. And that's uh, over there by Legion Park, by Dodge. Yeah. Stadium. Okay, now, now. How did you end up there? Your parents just said, I want you to be a good Catholic boy? Hell no. <laughs> he said, hell, hell no. Hell no, it wasn't that at all. My mom was trying to put me into Beverly Hills High School. I don't know why. I had good grades. I was a good, pretty good student. And um, she calls up the Board of Education and say, well, you know, I was thinking about the, the Beverly Hills High School, you know. Uh, you, you recommend that school, right? And the lady says, no. The fuck? She said, uh, a better school is Cathedral High School. She said, better than Beverly Hills High School? And better than Beverly Hills. It's rated, you know, the ratings were better, everything like that, and okay. So I take I take the entrance exam. I like, it's an all-boys Catholic high school. I wasn't really feeling that. I was now I was already, you know, I mean my junior high I was starting to get into the girl phase, you know what I mean? It's like how are you gonna take that opportunity away from me? I had to be all right, you know what I mean? So uh I take the test and I score really high and I get in. And I didn't talk to anybody for about four months. I'm really shy. I was really like shy, so I didn't talk to anybody. And um you know, after, after, you know, then, you know, I had religion class, I had to carry the Bible with me on every class because I had religion. And then next year, religion too, then theology. And it was in theology class that they showed the exorcist. What We're going to see something about the good versus evil and everything like this and blah, 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 blah. So, so they played, fuck me, fuck me. 
Yeah, the full version. Yes. Oh, fuck. Okay. I mean, my my. I mean, back in the day when I was going there, I mean, there were kids that were going to school with a Black Sabbath T-shirt, concert T-shirt on, going to a Catholic all boys high school. So you know, Black Sabbath had the little devil kid on yeah, there and everything yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. Going to going to class like that. Fuck. You know, after I left is when they decided to bring out the uniforms the and uniform shit, shit and everything. I had to be all correct. But nah, nah, we were ghetto. But the, the exorcist, like, now let me, did that fucking, sh did, it freaked me out. Did that freak you out? It freaked me out and all the kids were laughing at me because they all saw it. Fuck. Nah. And I, I was like, what the fuck? I'm going, yeah, like, all this shit. And they're laughing at me. Because like they all saw it, you know, their their parents didn't care. And I'm, yeah, you could see exorcism four years old. Fuck it, you know. Fuck my my parents were like, no. I mean, the 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 not the trailer, but the poster yeah. freaked me out yeah. with the dude standing there in the corner in the light and looking at the 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 fucking that, that shit fucking freaked me out. So I was already I was done. Yeah. I was already done. So I mean, I was standing up. I was like sitting down. I was like freaking out, and everybody was laughing at me. Dude, look at Freaky Tales. When we start the music, when we do that shit on Fridays, it starts off with the extras. <sighs> and like, it, it really, and it, her eyes are fucking rolling back, and then that bitch starts levitating. That's how we start that shit, bro. Damn. <laughs> he said, damn. Damn. <laughs> you know, my, 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 my girl says, no, I don't even want to see the trailer. I don't want to see that. Don't put that movie on. I mean, not even as a joke. Okay, then she's not going to want to see the Freaky Tales She intro. probably would, but she, no, no, but she probably would give it a shot, though. But, you know, when you look at the shit, you yeah. kind of like with the idol like this, like this. Yeah, maybe like that. I think. Oh, man. Okay, that one was my number one all-time freaky fucking movie. And then I have to say the original Omen. Great movie. Yes. Great movie. That the original yes. Omen was the yes. shit. Gregory yeah. Peck. And yeah. then when that fucking lady, she was like, Damon, is it just for you? And that bitch fucking hangs herself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. On his fucking birth. Like, yeah, what? yeah. I mean, yeah, I would have been freaked out already. I would have been fucked up. Then then when the baboons, when they're like going through the thing and the and baboons all going at, crazy. At the zoo. Yeah, the zoo. Yeah. You wanna know a, a, a movie that I now when I look at it, it's not so scary. The part that I ran out the theater. You ran out the theater? I ran out of the theater. Uh, it was the ending of Friday the 13th. Really? When Jason comes out of the water, the chick is like, they play all the nice music. The girl is waking up in the little boat in the canoe. And, 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 and all of a sudden, here comes Jason out the water. I was already standing up because I thought the movie was over. And I saw that shit. I ran. I booked it out the fucking people looking at me like what's wrong with this guy so yeah yeah you know one thing about okay i love all those movies i'm a huge michael myers fan i'm a huge fucking michael myers fan um michael freddy krueger jason okay but one thing about all those movies that are all predictable the people that are fucking get killed Every time, every time, you can see a girl on top of a dude, huh, 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 here goes fucking Jason. <laughs> here goes fucking Freddy Krueger. <laughs> here goes fucking Michael Myers. <laughs> and I'm like. I, I think that they're kind of rude. For yeah. Let, 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 let I'm like, finish. Yeah, I'm like, I'm not even safe. I mean, I, like, you know, I said, all right, man, I'll wait here for five more minutes. If you're not done, then, uh, you know, I would be, have to be I, considerate. I know a lot of dudes that are safe, but I'm not safe. So. <laughs> Yeah, but it sounded fucked up. You're right. You know, they all be all be making making love and whatnot, and then they get you know a fucking machete through their fucking chest. Yeah, roughneck style. <laughs> yeah. Okay, if you had a face one, Freddy Krueger, I almost said Michael Jackson, uh, uh, <laughs> Michael Myers, <laughs> or Jason. If you had a face one, who would you add the face? And Michael Jackson isn't on the list. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, shit, you know, Michael Myers, Freddy Krueger, Jason. If you had to face one in a fucking dark alley, who would that be? Oh, man, you know what? I'd face Michael Myers. I'd face Michael Myers, too. I would face, you know what? Because, see, Jason runs. Yes. Freddy Krueger runs. Uh, Michael Myers, 
he fast walks. Yeah, he, he he'll catch up to you. Yeah, he'll catch up, but he walks. You know, he's like, you know what? You run, you be running fast. Don't worry, I'll catch you. You know what I mean? I don't know how he does it, but he makes it there. Yeah, you know. But the other guys, they run, they do all that. I mean, Freddy Krueger disappears all over the fucking crazy. You know, Jason. You know, I, I. You know the thing with about with Jason. How did he? How did he get the mask? How did he change from like the, the the sheet over his head? Yeah. To the hockey mask. I don't think they ever explained that shit. So he just started out the movie. Just said, "I, I want a new new shit." Yeah, I'm on some L.A. King shit. I don't know. I don't like. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 want look, I want to look. I want to look at that again because you know then when on on Friday the Thirteenth Part Two, right? And Jason comes out. He's got this fucking like sheet with one hole for his eyes and shit. Like, and then all of a sudden he updates his shit, upgrades his shit to get the mask, and it's a nice mask too. It's like it's new. Nobody's playing hockey out there where he lives, right? right. So how did he get it? Uh, yeah, yeah. It's not explained. No, we're gonna have to email the writers. See? Yeah, because I'm. Go. I really want to know now. Because <laughs> okay, who wins in a fight? Chucky or Leprechaun? Chucky or Leprechaun? I had to give it to Chucky. <laughs> Me too. Chucky. I'll give it to Chucky. He man. was possessed. So yeah, yeah. He yeah, Leprechaun. He looked weird though. You know what I yeah, mean? He looked fucking real but, weird. For some reason, I felt like you can just kick the leprechaun, just like kick him for distance. You know, he's out there. I yeah. always, I used to always care. Uh, uh, my homeboy's kid, because I, he, his son was afraid of leprechaun, so I used to always like, I want me gold. And no. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as he heard that, he was fucking terrified. So, <laughs> it, 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 hey, Eric, I'll tell you what. When I was a fucking kid i i my imagination was fucking weird like i'll give an example one time i asked my older brother and i said hey who do you think will win in a fight and i was being 100 who do you think will win in a fight like bruce lee if he had his chuckle sticks against the exorcist wow that's interesting you know i think that you know bruce lee he might make it a few rounds i mean he'd get some good ones in but once you know, homegirl comes down with a spider walk and shit like that. He's done. Man. He ain't gonna be able to fuck with that. He's gonna say, "Whoa, yo, no, 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 I can't, I can't." Then, you know. But I mean, Bruce will get some good licks in. But after a while, you know, exorcists will get tired of getting hit with them nunchucks. You know what I mean? And then here comes a fucking spider walk. You know what I mean? Fuck shit up. That's what I, I think. I was just a, a, a fucking crazy kid with a fucking crazy mind, bro. But uh, my last one, whether you believe me or not, but I'm going to be real with you. Who would win, Muhammad Ali or Jaws? Or Jaws? Jaws. If you get Muhammad Ali to stand at the edge of the boat, here comes the shark. Boom, boom, boom. You know. You know. I'm not sure about Muhammad Ali's swimming <laughs> skills. You know what I mean? <laughs> He's a float by like a butterfly, a sting like a bee. He said nothing about swimming. <laughs> nothing. He had nothing about swimming, so I had to get that one to Jaws. I have. To, hey, hey, remember when he fucking swallowed Quint? Remember fucking Jaws? Yeah. That was a fucking amazing scene right there, bro. That kind of freaked me out, especially when he took that bite and in the blood. So, <laughs> like that. Dude, and back nasty. then, no special effects. Yeah. I mean, have you ever thought, like, what would you have done, like, if you were, like, the last dude that was, like, you know, and the boat is fucking sinking in? If he didn't shoot perfect. and hit that shit perfect, done. 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 Dude, uh, what, what was his name? Something Schneider, last name? Yeah, yeah. R Roy. Roy. Roy Schneider. I was, oh, my God. That was such a fucking dope-ass fucking movie when he blew his fucking as now we had ceviche all over the sea yeah like, i know i know man <laughs> fucking <laughs> that shit was dope that, that shit was ill let me take a little bit more simple some uh transmission fluid real fast shit this is what b was talking about this was the part that he was talking yeah, about this, this was it this was it this motherfucker it. tastes like you put you have a menthol in your mouth <laughs> and you take a swig of pa patron silver 
You guys have too much fun here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I see you. I see but you. um, three one no micheladas, you guys. Make sure you guys get addicted. Okay, hit them up. Don't fuck around. Okay, I know. I see you eating that top ramen right now. Okay, so let that. Sh <laughs> <laughs> if you guys are hungry, you know. It, it, go, I mean, go. Let's say about top ramen. Do you remember when top ramen first came out? The packet was like about this big, yes, right? Yes. Now top ramen, that shit is about like yay big, right? <laughs> You notice that, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Same price. Same. But that shit is like half size. Yeah. Well, they're, missing, they're about missing about 50, 60 noodles. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, the cup of noodles, you open that motherfucker, it's only half of noodles. Let's be honest, it's only half of it's those fucking noodles. It's only half noodles. noodles. You're like, come on, sorry, motherfuckers. That same ass fucking cup, if you go to somebody's job at a vending machine, that's three bucks. You go to Food for Less, four for one dollar. Food for less is the fucking business. <laughs> hey, he said, food for less is the fucking business. It's the fucking business, man. Hey, you get food for less. You do. <laughs> you know, that that just occurred to me right now. <laughs> fucking, you get food for less. Like, I've been searching for the best fucking prices. <laughs> All I had to do was just fucking go to food for less. <laughs> Fuck, man. Yes, yes. You learn something new every day, man. Every fucking day, bro. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Why not? Food for less. That's what I do. I go stock up. And then, you know, every once in a while, my brother's the one that taught me how to do spreads. You know, you get the, the fucking cheap ass uh, fucking ramen, add chicharron, fucking beef jerky, and a bunch of other bullshit on there. And I looked at that motherfucker after a podcast, and I was like, fuck it, let me try it. And I was like, <sighs> open up the bag of cheese, I don't pour more. And I'm like, fuck, this motherfucker's pretty good. Yo, what I love about Food for Less, the minute you walk in there and it says, okay, meat for dinner, and it fucking have a big ass fucking <laughs> rolls, fucking <laughs> neck bones, all this fucking shit right there in front. I mean, you just walk in, it's like, boom. Like in, you know, you don't even get a minute. That's here you go. Here's a fucking rump roast for your ass. <laughs> He's got a rump roast. Ro rump roast look, for look, less. I'm going to give a guy. shout out to my boy, uh, Chino, the Puerto Rican lover. Puerto Rican. Okay. He introduced me to Empacalao. That's what he introduced me to. And I fell in love with it. And I was like, fuck it. Love it. Yeah, that's that's a codfish. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's a little rough for me. My mom would have to sneak it to me so my mom <laughs> makes some dope bacalao but i wasn't fucking with it it's something with the smell i wasn't fucking with it. <laughs> so don't <laughs> laugh so <laughs> <laughs> and 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 then one day she makes it with rice and everything and she like waits till i finish eating and i just grub it down and did you like that? Huh? I said, yeah, that was great. Hell I said, yeah. yeah, that was rice with bacalao. I said, what? Rice with bacalao. I was like, you know, I mean, it was already good. I can like fake the fun, like try to get sick or whatnot. Right. That shit was mad good right there. So, you know, it's 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 good, you know. Talking about I told this I didn't tell I didn't tell my girl that I'll tell this. I told the story today of what my girl did to me the other night. Um, <laughs> we having dinner, right? We having dinner, and uh, she decides that yeah, no, no, I'm gonna cook the rice. Okay. What she does is that she takes some cannabis infused oh shit butter, can of butter or whatnot, and she puts it onto the rice. No shit. Doesn't tell me nothing. Puts it on the rice, and everything. And then she gives me a plate and has some salmon, asparagus, and the rice. Sounds Wonderful good. Plate. Good. Here you go. Enjoy. Toma, papi. Toma. <laughs> Boom. Okay. I go for seconds. What do I go? True stoner. What do I go for seconds? The rice. The rice. So, whoa, no problem. So she gives me another thing of rice. And before I go for that big ass bite, she says, can I tell you something? I said, what? The rice is infused with can of butter. I said, what? The rice is infused with can of butter. 
I said, oh, word? I continue eating. I'm like, what am I going to do? I'm going to stop now. And you know that fucking, uh, that I, I hate it. The fucking filter on IG. That thing is like, ding, 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 <laughs> ding, ding, ding. Yeah, she got me. I was fucking knocked the fuck out. <laughs> and she did it. She made a movie about me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She goes, throw my papa. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you hungry? Oh, you like that, huh? Uh, have a little more. Go ahead. She put the whole thing. I saw how much you put in there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why that just came up to me. And I'm talking about rice and talking about food like that. Yeah. No, no but that's not about some good, healthy eating. So all good. No, no, it was good, healthy eating. No, it was I, good. I, it was I love good. good, healthy eating. Yeah, it was good. Uh, let me ask you, are you a sushi guy? Love it. I fucking love I sushi. I will fuck some sushi up. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, now, once again, Steve Yano introduced me to sushi. He Before we got the studio in Alhambra, he had a house in Alhambra where we started recording like two songs. It was just an empty house, and he left me there. My mom had kicked me out of the crib. And she says, you know what? Get out of here, blah, blah, blah. Make a long story short. I told Steve, I got nowhere to live. Come live with me. Gives me the keys to the house. I'm there. He's there eating some sushi from Bristol Farms in Pasadena, mm. okay? And uh, actually close to it, like where Stuart Wiley used to live. And uh, I go, what the fuck is this, bro? He goes, it's sushi. And I was like, sushi? Like, I don't eat this shit. Like, well, he left and he had like Asahi beer, you know, Japanese beer. So I'm like, fuck, I'm fucking hungry. So I take the fucking seaweed off, you know, cause they had the, it was wrapped in seaweed. I ate the fucking rice, I ate the little piece of shrimp, the little fucking piece of cucumber. And before you know it, I ate the whole shit except the fucking whole seaweed. Mm. So I said, fuck it, let me just try it with the fucking seaweed. I was drunk as fuck after drinking like three asahis, you know, the big, the yeah, 22s. The big boys. Yeah, and then I fucking started doing the, uh, I, here's where I fucked up. I thought wasabi was uh, 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 avocado. Oh, oh, you yeah, you fucked up. Yeah, I so I know. grabbed the big ass piece of wasabi and I put it on top of the sushi. And I'm gonna just what the fuck is like, fuck me up, bro. Mm. If my, you know, you the fucking yeah, boogers yeah, not yeah, coming, yeah, yeah. everything. Yeah. But from that point on, I was like, the next day, hey, let's go get some sushi. And Steve had that voice, what? And I was like, yeah, let's go get some sushi. Let's go. And I was like, all right, fuck it, let's go. I want to try that. I want to try that. I want to try that. And then I've been. Been a fucking sushi. I eat sushi once a week. Sushi is definitely the move. I, I've I've been eating sushi since I was like young. Me and my mom would go out to eat sushi and everything like that, and and go out with my dad. We'd go to the sushi bar. Yeah. And you know, and then when you go over at the sushi bar and, and they get to know you and you're there enough, yeah, then yeah. they start giving you like love, love. And specialty rolls and shit. Mm -hmm. Shit that's not exactly on the menu, but just like some special shit. <laughs> you know what I mean? Hell yeah. And, and and it is so good. And I love sake. Oh my God. Don't even fucking get me I started. I love sake. So Fuck. I will go I will go ham on some sake. And when I did drink beer, I would do sake bombs like sake bombs. nobody's business. You know, so yeah, that and sushi, uh, uh, I can do that. I'll Seven tell you what, Bubble, when shit opens up, let's go get some sushi somewhere. Yeah. I mean, serious. I mean, I'm, I'm like, I'm not just like California roll. No, no, no. no, no, no. Fuck I, that. I go, I go in. Bring me some eel. Yeah, yeah. In, some in, eel, <laughs> salmon skin, cut roll, hand rolls, all that. Yeah. Let me go you. in. We'll, go, go we'll in. be there for five hours. Yeah. I'll go in. Easy. Like, serious. I'll Easy. spend the night. You know, I have no qualms in just sitting in my car, just let the food go down. You know, we've all been there, you know, you un unhook your pants. <laughs> you know, sometimes you do it in the restaurant, you know, and no shame in the game. No, when the motherfuckers keep giving you free sake bottle, I'm like, fuck your one more then, you know? Oh, yeah. Oh. Hell yeah. I yeah. mean, you know, there's like in little Tokyo, there's a spot that is open to like four or five in the morning. No shit. Yes. So when this shit happens, you know, if you like want sushi at two in the morning, you can go there and go to the sushi bar and oh, get it like that. Fuck you know yeah, I mean? that's that's the shit. Okay, so, so that, that, that's the move. Now, sushi you can't get sushi at like every store. Right, right. right. Like, I tried sushi at Food for Less. <laughs> it wasn't bad. <laughs> 
pero it's food for less. You know what I mean? You know, and maybe, you know, and nobody was rolling nothing. That shit, <laughs> that shit was just there. It was there, <laughs> sitting there. How it got there, I don't know, but it was there. You know, you see people making tortillas. You see people making shit like that, but nobody was making no sushi. And nobody looked like they made sushi back there. <laughs> so like, uh, don't, don't, don't do that. Don't right, do it. Right. I will not recommend that, you know, if you're really, you know. Right. If, if you're desperate. <laughs> yeah. If yeah. you're desperate, you know. Because I've had sushi where the rice tasted like that. Cottage cheese shit on your ceiling, you know, like it literally tasted like that. But when shit opens up, I'm going to invite you on me. We're going to have sushi all fucking night. Okay. Okay. We're just going to order a gang of shit. And I, I, look, I'm going to be real with you. I still don't know how to try it. For many years, I've been, you know, using, you know, those, uh, uh, what do you call those little plastic shit? Those cheat sticks. I still use that. I'm not going to fucking lie, big dog. You know, either that or I'm going to use like Mexican style. Like on Okay. Well, the thing you know. is, just so you know, I mean, there, there are the two ways of eating the sushi. I mean, and they're both correct. You can do it with the chopsticks or you could do it with your hand. It's nothing wrong with it. So if you go in like animal style with your hand, shit like that, do that shit. You know, it, it works. I do it. Too. I mean, I, I mean, I eat with chopsticks, but after a while, it's like fuck it. You know what I mean? You want to go and get in? Hell yeah! You don't want to get in there. So. Hell yeah! Uh, uh, Eric, one of your favorite comedians of all time, Richard Pryor. Richard Pryor, second comedian of all time. Second comedian of all time. Let me give you mine. I'm not about to say Eddie Murphy. He won me over with Delirious and Raw. Eddie Murphy, yeah. Oh, oh, you know, I would, I would, I would say Eddie Murphy is definitely in the top three. Uh, um, Red Fox, definitely Red fucking Red Fox. Fox. I mean, I remember he he had a comedy album, and I couldn't wait to hear it, but I had to wait till you know either my parents were asleep or weren't at home, and the name of the album was "You Got to Wash Your Ass." <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, and yeah. I, and I wanted to hear that so bad, and the cover of it was like Red Fox. You know, holding the tail of a of a horse, and like looking like this, and that you gotta wash your ass. I like something like that intrigued me. Like I need to hear what he has to say on this record. Speaking of that, on Netflix, Eddie Murphy plays Rudy Ray Moore. Did you watch that one? Yeah, so that was fucking dope. I I, I enjoyed it. I, I enjoyed it. I, he, he he nailed it. He nailed Hula it. Dula the whole house ruler. He, he, that he, motherfucker he nailed it. I mean, he nailed it so so good. I mean, me and my girl, we were watching it that we went to the original Dolomite after that. Really? And saw like the OG, yeah, the OG. And like seeing like some of the scenes and what they took with the movie, it yeah. was really dope to kind of see it that way. Yeah. Because you're seeing the story and then about how things were made and then you see the movie, the OG movie, yeah. and how everything like that, it was, it was dope. That one was fucking dope. A um, couple of my, okay, my first, my all time, I'm gonna ask you this. Your all time, now I want you to think about this. I'm gonna give you mine first. Everybody already fucking knows. Everybody listening to Rodin Radio already knows what my all time favorite comedy movie is. Number one, Coming to America. Mm. Coming to America. You know, uh, number two, Harlem Nights. But Coming to America, remember? She's your queen to be. That shit, like. And then, uh, Let Your Soul Glow. Let your soul glow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, how are they going to be able to top that with Coming to America Part 2? I, I don't know. Is that out yet? No, not yet. Not, not yet. yet. Not yeah. Yet. I, you know, I mean, I think maybe they waited a little too long. A, a little 20 years, almost 30 years too long. You know, and this, I mean, I don't know. We'll see what happens, you know. I just want to see Eddie do some stand-up. Yes. yes. That's what I, I, that's, you know, quit bullshitting. You know what I mean? Just do some stand. We know you can act and you can act and do serious roles and shit like that. Get back on the stage and yeah. do do some stand up. Yeah. And then like kill it, knock it out the park. Yes, yes. You know, yes, I, yes. I miss I I I always watch co uh comedy and comedians and stuff like that and, and I like the raw I mean Bernie Mac and those those kind of people like that, you know, uh Eddie Murphy, Richard Pryor, George Carlin, you know. 
Dave Chappelle. He's yes. get, he, Dave Chappelle is getting raw yes, now. Yes, yes. And he's I'm, he's starting to get real, real raw. I'm he's, glad he is. You yes. know, which is which is dope. Uh, 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 let me see who else. Um, Steve Harvey is good on Family Feud. He's good on Family Feud. Is that a joke? <laughs> okay. He's good on Family Feud. <laughs> Back to the question. You're, you're <laughs> Your favorite comedy movie of all time. <laughs> uh, comedy movie. Favorite comedy movie of all time. <laughs> I would have to say, uh, fuck it, it's between uh, Blazing Saddles and, oh st and Stir Crazy. Blazing with Gene Wilder. Yes. Blazing, Blazing you know, fucking Saddles, man. That shit is fucking Eric, hilarious. I'm going to have to ask you something, okay? I never asked you this, Okay. But I think we're on the same page, okay? I'm gonna guess, and tell me if I'm wrong, okay? Okay. I'm 52, you're 52. Yeah. 1968. Yeah. Yeah. There it is. I'm not even psychic, like I don't even have a crystal ball, homie. I just have an old 40 ounce bottle of old English with dirty water in it, and that's how I can see the future. <laughs> You saw that shit right there. Yeah. That's that's like when my mom would we'd go to a restaurant, Chinese restaurant, and you know, you had the tea with the leaves and shit. And she said, I wanna tell your future. That's an old mojito. Yeah, like this. And she's like looking out there and she's like, and it says you're going to be real famous and big and you know. Some of the shit that she said was true. Reading those fucking yeah, I leaves. Believe, I believe it. Even though I knew that she could not read not one of those leaves. Hey, but mama knows best. But mama knows best. Mama knows best. So, so you said Blazing Saddles or Stir Crazy. Stir Crazy. What was the name of that movie? I think fuck something train or a, a classic scene where Richard Pryor is walking down the street. No, not even down the street. Silver Streak. I think it was, and the KKK walks in back of him. Silver Street. Yes, he's walking down the street, you know, mind his own fucking, and then fucking KKK rolls up with a fucking bird. That was a fucking classic ass scene. I mean, bro. classic shit, classic shit. So those, those kind of, the kind of comedies that, you know, movies that I just remember I can laugh and. Yes, yeah, yes, all yes. that shit. Uh, I'll tell you another one that, like going a little bit to the 90s, Ace Ventura. Fucking Jim Carrey. Jim Carrey is a funny motherfucker. That Definitely. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell you another guy. And this is kind of like maybe on the kiddie side, but I'll tell you who was one of my favorite all time like comedian actors. Robin Williams. Robin Williams. He was dope. I liked him since Mork and Mindy. Mork and Mindy. But when he did uh, fucking Aladdin, the cartoon. Mm -hmm. Okay, of course, everybody has kids. We watched them with them. Fuck, that was such a fucking classic movie. So when I saw, uh, como se llama este way, uh, Will Smith do it. Yeah. You know, a lot of people criticize him for that, but that was the best that he did. It's hard to fill in shoes, you know, when it comes to Robin Williams. You right. Know, you know, I'll tell you who would have made a great genie uh, on the, the new Aladdin. I'm going to tell you the truth, at least in my opinion. Jim Carrey, because of the way he acted in the movie Mask. Remember that movie Mask? Mm -hmm. I think he would have made a great genie. So you're meaning to tell me that Will Smith was Aladdin? He was the genie. In he Aladdin. was the genie? Yes. Yeah. You didn't know that? No, no. I'm, 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 and I'm gonna. I'm glad you told me about it because that's okay, gonna I'm, be a hard pass for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm, I, mm, I don't. No, nah. nah I'm, I'm good. <laughs> yeah, he was the genie. So hurry up and sip that so I can give you more. No, no, no. There's more on Let It. No, no, no. <laughs> Transmission fluid. Shit. <laughs> and my, my mode is starting to putter up. <laughs> You're going to start twitching and shit. <laughs> this was the part of the interview that Beaver was like, this is it. Yeah, yeah. This yeah. is it. This is it. Okay, uh, let's go to another one. This dumb question. I know you traveled all over the world, probably several times. No, mm -hmm. most definitely several times. <sighs> what was one place that you visited that you said, fuck yeah, I got to visit. Let me give you mine. 
1992, I got to go to Philadelphia and I visited the Rocky Steps. Mm. That one was like, I was like all chi on, like <laughs> that type of shit. Mm. Like, because I grew up watching Rocky since the 70s. Right. So I was like on some like, fuck, I'm here. Of course, everybody runs up and does it, even though I didn't win shit, but I was still, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I yeah. was there. Yeah. You know, is there one place that you can say, Fuck, I'm here. I got to visit, you know. Yeah. The exorcist steps. Okay, I didn't go there. I didn't go there. The exorcist steps. Tell us about it. And, you know, first of all, in the movie, you know, those, you know, at the end when, you know, he goes and he jumps out the fucking window and he goes down them steps and, yeah, it just was just like, Walking by there and just looking at it, and just I can see that scene in my head. Like, yes, I mean, even them filming, just knowing that they filmed it, it was a stunt, do whatever. But right, those steps looked fierce. Yes, yes. What, 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 where exactly was that at? That was like in this in Maryland. Okay, yeah, that's in Maryland. Did, did you know uh, Soren Baker? Uh, yes, yes, I know, yes. I know. He's from Maryland, and fuck, I'm gonna have to hit him up, find out where those steps are at, because remember when that motherfucker goes, come into me, mm -hmm. come into me, and the fucking devil jumped on his ass? Yeah, yeah. I was like, fuck that. <laughs> I, I'm not gonna be like coming, I'll be like, get the fuck out of here. You know, but, and he committed suicide, and he fucking, bro, oh, that fucking movie. And then that fucking name of that, the name of the girl, Reagan. Who names her daughter Reagan? So, I can answer that, but I'm not going to. Okay. <laughs> it's kind of like naming your. It's kind of like naming your son Judas, you know. Okay, I'm gonna tell you a quick story. No lie, no. Lie. I'm not gonna mention his name. My boy is from originally from Guatemala. Mm -hmm. Okay. And he, you know, he lived out here for like 20 years, so he flew his sister out and her husband out. They were out. They were so happy. She was pregnant that they're gonna have their child here in the US. She wanted to give him a great American name. Okay? No fucking lie. He told me like this, uh, Tony, do you know what they named him? And I was like, no, what did they name him? They named him Hitler. No. They fucking named his ass Hitler, bro. <laughs> they named his fucking ass Hitler. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you know, I I thought I thought, you know, what if you had a kid and you named him like, you know, Sir. You know what I mean? Especially like if he was in the UK. Yeah. Where they say, Oh sir, sir, sir. Imagine the uh, the teacher has to call you have to call me sir. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? Anything rather I mean, I would I would be flexing like that. Yeah. Says, sir, no, you call me, sir. My name is Sir. Call me, sir. Yeah. But fucking Hitler? Hitler. The fuck? Like. Hitler. Yeah, I would have called him Ron Jeremy or something. Fuck. <laughs> Hitler. Hitler, huh? <laughs> a great American name? That's what they said. A great American name. And they came up with fucking Hitler. But he wasn't American, though. <laughs> they, they, I mean, fuck. <laughs> You know, I mean, I mean, I've been, i a lot of Mexican women that have told me, um, uh, like I gave my son, you know, well, they speak broken English, you know, and I'm not trying to make fun of them, but si I'm a Brad, what Brad, Brad, si como el Brad Pitt. <laughs> All right, cool. You know, Brad, <laughs> si I'm a Mason, oh, no, Mason. No, no problem. You know, I'm not, I'm not trying to make fun, but I'm like, fuck, like, okay, but fucking Hitler, like, <laughs> Damn, that, yeah, you got me on that one. <laughs> you got me on that one. I mean, I mean, I can fuck with Brad. Yeah, me you too. Know, I mean, I can do Brad. Como el Brad Pitt. Yeah, como el Brad Pitt. Pero. You know. Hitler. <laughs> How you say Hitler? Fuck, bro. <laughs> so, like, I mean, and now, and now, and now, you know what? This shit have made me think fucked up shit right now. Yeah, 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 like, yeah. Keep, keep going. Keep it pushing. You know what I'm saying? It's like, you know, if you say, 
No, no, that's this is all wrong. <laughs> it's all wrong, man. It's no, no, no. That's a good angle mentality. <laughs> Blame wrong. it on him. No, no, but it's like you know, hey, you know, hey, hit the, hey, hit the, yeah, man. hey, you know what I mean? That could be really fucked up. It could be you know really what I mean? Fucked. Exactly. Well, exactly. He let it. He let it. He, he, he let it. Oh, yeah, he let it. <laughs> hey, he let it. <laughs> it's fucked up, man. Okay. What is in that shit, man? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. I think he stepped on that shit barefooted and fucking squeezed it out and poured it in a fucking bottle. Okay. The, no, you know what it is? It's truth serum. Truth serum. That's what it is. You know? well. it, it makes you tell the truth. So uh, just don't give it to your girlfriend because she'll pour it in your rice and I, <laughs> okay top movies of all time let me give you one not in order Mo just movies in general gladiators one i fucking love gladiator carlitos way okay and i would have probably oh man this movie fucking breaks the pianist oh wow the pianist okay, okay. And then I would have to throw in there. It's, it's a weird movie, but uh, uh, the girl with the dragon tattoo. You okay. Wish you yeah, yeah, I know which one that is. Yeah, that was a fucking weird movie, but I like that fucking mm -hmm. movie. And um, I'll give you one more, one more, one more. Um, it, and it's out there for some people: the Passion of the Christ. You know, the passion of that's a deep movie, but man, it's it's crazy bloody, man. Crazy bloody. They they beat his ass. I mean Yeah. They they really gave him an excessive beatdown. I mean, yeah. it's like one of those Instagram type of beatdowns that you be seeing, you know what I mean? Like it was like bad. Yeah, it was. Yeah. It was. Um for me, Godfather one and two. Okay. Um, the Deer Hunter. The Deer Robert De Niro. Robert De Niro. Uh, I used to watch that a lot with my dad. Um, mm. it does un poquito okay, más, just, and then just, that's just, it. Just that's a little it. bit. That's, that's it. it. Just a little bit more. Right. it. Help me, baby. <laughs> she, she, She's she. like you. Like looking like. <laughs> Here you go. That's it, bro. Right. Just what the doctor's ordered. Uh, okay. It's been a minute. Um. Uh, I, I like Goodfellas and Scarface. I'm I'm a gangster. Yes, 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 yes. Mafia kind of. I like that. Scarface is incredible. Yes. I don't think it should be remade. No, don't even touch it. I don't think that that movie that just leave that alone. Just just let it stay stuck in yes, time, yes, and yes. that's it. Did you hear? And I heard this like two years ago. Who was supposed to play Scarface? Did you ever hear that? No. Okay. This is what I heard. And and I hope I'm instead, wrong. Instead of Al Pacino or this is for something new? No, something new. Okay. I, I heard it was going to be a new movie just called Scarface. You know who was supposed to be him? Ooh. Hey, but that bit? No. <laughs> Close. <laughs> Close. Leonardo DiCaprio. Oh. Come on. He was supposed to play a Cuban. Okay. Come on. Okay, Leonardo DiCaprio. That's what that's what I heard. I hope I'm fucking wrong, but that's what you I know, heard. No, I mean, yo, he's he's homie. He's cool. But no, 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 no. no hey, Scarface no. just has so many fucking lines, bro, that we can quote. Yeah, so. yeah. I mean, you just have to leave that shit alone. You know what I'm mad about is that they fucking in in Miami. They there used to be the the Scarface Hotel. No shit. The Scarface Hotel, which is basically where they filmed a scene where homie with the the how would I the too the, that yeah, motherfucker the, yeah the chainsaw and shit like that and how they was running down the stairs and everything like that. Well, for a while that was a hotel and they nicknamed it the Scarface Hotel and they had pictures inside of the movie and shit like that and you see the stairs and everything. Now that shit is a CVS pharmacy. Wow. First of all, you don't need to have any CVS pharmacy on the ocean, uh, on South Beach. You right, know right. Uh, but yeah, it, it was there. And you know, 
the scene where he's coming to like Montana Financial. Yes. That building, that's off of Sunset Drive. Sunset Boulevard. Really? Yes. Okay. I'm going to tell you what ruined Hall the movie Halloween for me. I'm going to tell you. And we'll come back to Scarface right now. These motherfuckers filmed Halloween and said it hadn't filled Illinois. And that fucking bullshit movie was fucking filmed in Pasadena. All my life, Eric, I said, I'm going to go to Haddonfield, Illinois. And I'm going to go visit the Michael Myers house. You know, where, where he killed motherfuckers. And then somebody said, Stuart fucking Wiley told me, oh, that's down the street. The fuck you talking about? They filmed it right here. No, they didn't. Fucking took me to the fucking house. To the Michael Myers house, bro. It's right in Pasadena. And fuck, they filmed it all, and they call it Haddonfield, Illinois. I was fucking crushed, bro. How mad would you have been if you had gone to Illinois? Oh, just as mad as I was when Wham broke up. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. My, yeah, that was harsh. George Michaels and Andrew Richley broke up. I was like, what the? Yeah. Why? You're like, how? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> not okay. you. Not you two. <laughs> okay. okay. Let's go back to fucking... When the fuck were we at? Were we, uh, oh yeah, Scarface. 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 <laughs> fuck. Okay. Yeah, Scarface. Oh, I don't think that that movie should be remade at all. No, don't. I mean, that. There, there's certain movies, you know, if you want to remake Gone with the Wind or whatever like that, fucking be my guest. But don't fuck with like Scarface. No, don't, don't. Don't try to fucking remake The Godfather. Don't try to remake. There's certain things, you know. You, if you want to remake uh, Close Encounters. <laughs> okay, then fine, no problem. They try to remake freaking Freddy Krueger. Oh, what that, happened with that? I didn't like that. See, that motherfucker had a lisp. Hey, motherfucker! I'm like, what the fuck? I'm like, what the? <laughs> 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 I didn't notice that he had a lisp. <laughs> fuck Here, that movie. Here's the Freddy. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, if you if you if you were part of that movie, fuck you. But anyways, yeah, you know that you know like the Omen. They didn't need to remake them. No, they didn't. They didn't. You know, they they don't need to remake a movie like Grease. Definitely not Grease. And and look what they did. They had made Grease two, and they, that was terrible. They don't need to make remake Saturday Night Fever. No, Saturday Night Fever, def definitely not. Saturday Night Fever is a fucking classic. I was just watching it, not to look. The fucking music, bro. The, j j the scenery, the, the, the All fucking that shit. amazing, All bro. Right. So there's just, you know, certain movies that you just leave it alone and that's it. You, you know which movie they should never remake and I heard there was talks of it? And it hurts me to even fucking say it. The Warriors. No, see, see, now that's where they're fucking up. Yeah, because first of all, it ain't even like that now in in New York. That 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 vibe is not even like that. They have to make new shit. Yeah. You got to leave that shit alone. The baseball furies, remember? Have yeah. dropped the ball. That shit was fucking hard. Yo, I mean, there's one Halloween that we we in Cyprus we do a, ha a haunted hill show, and we do it like we've been doing it for the past like twenty or some odd years, and we talked about going on stage as the the baseball guys of the fucking warriors wow you know because they would they were dope but i mean they had the dopest fucking Hell outfits yeah. when they came out and they was like fucking baseball out and shit like that yeah. and their faces painted that was the shit that was the shit and if you really think about it that's kind of where they got the idea in my opinion for that movie dead presidents remember when all white that's yeah. a good movie dead yeah presidents. dead presidents uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Alan and Albert Hughes, their very first videos ever was, was uh, for Art Mean High Seas, a song called Leave My Curls Alone. And then we did uh, Send in the Park. After that, they went and did Tupac. Then they went and did, uh, uh, como se llama? They, they did the Sitting in the Park video. They did Sitting in the Park oh, video. Shit. Then they did uh, that fucking movie, como se llama? Fuck. Uh, that gangster movie. Um, uh, fuck. It wasn't that president. No, no, is it? No, it was it. Um, no, it wasn't. American. With old dog in it, old dog. Um, I'm having a menace for it. Menace, menace society? society. That's it. Menace, menace society. society. So they did. The, they went ahead and did that. Um, but 
But I remember they were like 21 years old when they first started doing our fucking videos. That's crazy. Yeah, man. So you know, it's it's crazy when you think about it how certain things like connect. You know, there's like this big tree and like the connections. You know yeah. what I mean? Like a lot of people wouldn't, you know, that I have know of Steve Yano and and his contributions may not even know that <clears throat> I I played on. Uh, albums on Scandalous Records and you right. know, was there, you know, and he would call me personally to come down and 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 play and something like that. You know, the the connections is yeah. just nuts. I mean, Send Dog tells me too, like, I mean, he's Cuban and in the house they would always be listening to Latin music and and his dad never came to to see a Cypress show. The first time, the first and only time that he has seen a Cypress show is my first gig with Cypress. When they, he found out that I was playing with him because he was a fan of my dad. No shit. So Sundog's dad didn't come just for, for Sundog. He came to see me play because he was a fan of my dad. Wow. And I didn't know that Sundog anything knew of my dad or even heard about, you know, knew about it because they would hear it in their house. So the crazy connections, you know, I mean, if you really think about it, I mean, this world is so small. Yeah. You know, and I mean a lot of a lot of people wouldn't know the connection, you know. Yeah. That 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 do we got. I mean, fuck. That was what, more than twenty to thirty years ago. Yeah. About thirty years ago. Most definitely. Most definitely, and it was also a Japanese vendor from the city of Whittier. You, you know what's funny? My brother used to always make fun of Steviano because he was a Japanese guy, but he loved like oldies. He loved the Chicano culture. And he used to, my brother used to like, he's a fucking clown. And Steve knew he was a clown. He was like, Steve, are you a Japanese or are you a sleepy ass Mexican? You know, because. <laughs> <laughs> and Steve used to be like, I'm a sleepy ass Mexican because he loved Mexican food. You know, he just loved the fucking Mexican food. Moving to uh, Mexican food, what is if you had one Mexican dish that you love? If there's one, I'll give you mine. I love chile verde. If it's in a it, pork meat, I rarely eat pork, but if I'm gonna eat chile verde, it's gotta be pork. And it could just be with beans and rice, or it could be in a wet burrito. What is your favorite Mexican dish? Um, my go-to has always been like enchiladas and refried beans and rice. That's always been my thing. Yeah. Uh, either it's cheese enchiladas or beef or chicken. That's been my thing. And then I can also go with uh, an asada burrito. Hell yeah. And I just recently, you know, acquired a, a taste uh, for the mole oh shit uh, I, I was really weird on mole and I tried it in, in Mexico City and, and I really liked it and I haven't tasted it good since and found a spot that it, it's, it's, it's bomb and so yeah and you know uh, you know my girl from she's from Alisco she, she, she knows how to Make some good stuff. So obviously, so. You love not only Mexican food but Mexican women. Uh, you know, <laughs> it, you know, am I wrong? Could you blame me or what? You know, <laughs> ¿Y qué tiene? ¿Y qué tiene? <laughs> now, were you in Mexico City? Did you go to the pyramids? No, no, no. I, I missed that. I, I, I was, I was. Uh, uh, no, we we didn't have time to really go to the to the pyramids, but it's on the bucket list. Okay, it's yeah. on the bucket list. He, I'm gonna tell you what's on my bucket list, straight up, okay? I'm gonna go to Egypt. And I wanna not only try if they allow me, but I wanna climb the pyramids or at least sit on the fucking pyramids. You wanna get shot? I know, I know. I, and I believe you've been there. Uh, yes. Yes. That's why I said. Yeah. No, this. You know, first of all, when you go there, you have to deal with the hustle of the people trying to get you to ride a camel. Camel, yes. And motherfuckers will bust your ass. The camel, ride the camel, the camel. You know? 
and it's beautiful, but yeah, you can't get up on, on the, you can't climb up. Hey, and, and I'm gonna tell you why, Bubble, because since I've been in my 20s, I studied like ancient history. I'm gonna tell you what I've studied, Assyria, Egypt, uh, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, and Israel. I truly believe that I've studied more of ancient history than I have my own history as far as mental. Damn, you, was in, you didn't miss class, huh? Yeah, I, I did, I didn't. I, and, and I read a lot on that, but when it came to Egypt, I know a lot about Egyptology as far as their hieroglyphics, their cartouche, but each, each stone weighs fucking five tons. Back in the day, the pyramids were all white. Imagine seeing them with the, with the light shining, with the sun shining on them, and you couldn't even split them with a razor blade. It was just so perfect. Mm -hmm. We can make CDs, we can make you know music, uh, we can make, uh, as far as cell phones, we can call somebody across the world, but we cannot figure out how the pyramids were made. No. They, they, they are incredible when you see them. Yes. They are incredible. Going to Egypt is, in, is incredible. I was there for like, just on a vacation for like five days and got a chance to go into like some of the temples. Uh, I got a drum from out there. I bought a darbuka from out there. Uh, uh, I went uh, with uh, Mario C and MCA at BC Boys, rest in peace. We just went out there after we finished our Europe tour. Yeah. And we had a show in Tel Aviv and then she says, you know, in Tel Aviv, wow. we had we we finished the tour in Tel Aviv, and then we just said, "Yo, Cairo's just an hour away. Let's go." So we just did that. Got suits made, whole experience there for five days. It was incredible. It was incredible. Wow. And the other trip was that when I was a kid, you you know, you remember when King Tut came. You know, and it was like in the museums and shit like that and came to, to the States. Yeah. So I saw King Tut yeah. when I was in grade school. Yeah. Well, when I went to Egypt, King Tut was there, back there in the museum. Yeah, he was back home pretty right. much. So I saw him again and I went and I saw King Tut like in his home, like right there, you know what I mean? Deep, you know, and it's just beautiful. The thing with traveling and just being able to see the different parts of the world and yeah. different cultures is just a learning experience. You know what I mean? You know, you you know, you can read about it, you can see pictures, but it's not until you touch that soil and you're there and you can see it with your own eyes and you can touch it, whatever, that you can really feel. Yeah. You know what's up. Yeah. You know? uh, um, what was that? That I, I, oh man, I want to say fuck because I have a membership. I'm gonna be with the bubble. When I retire one day, I'm gonna take either two places where I'm gonna work at. Either at a museum to be like a fucking tour host, like little kids that come from grade school, or I'm gonna work at a library. I, w I just wanna be around children and help educate the next generation. That's what I wanna do, okay? Uh, but either at a museum or a library. But now, uh, as far as like um, Pompeii, Pompeii, um, supposedly this, uh, como se llama fucking, fuck, what the fuck is, volcano blew up and it just destroyed everybody from Pompeii. So I got to see like Pompeii like exhibits and, and I studied Pompeii and I understood it. And it just fascinated me. These people didn't have a warning. This shit just fucking blew up. People fucking died. Okay. But going to Egypt to me and seeing if we believe that the Bible is true, Moses was once there, Joseph was once there, obviously King Tut, Pharaoh, etc. They were all there. These were world powers at one time, you know. And to be able to go back there and to revisit and to see this is to me. Egypt, you've been there, but Egypt is a month. You, you should definitely go and 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 see that, like being able to see something that has been there for so many years, so so long, and still standing, and still standing, and you know, like when you go, I, I did the the walk, uh, the Jesus walk 
in 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 Tel Aviv in Israel. Yeah, the, the Via de la Rosa. You know, and, and and then you go and there's all the stops like when he fell from the cross, everything like this, and it goes all the way down to the, to the tomb. You did that? Did that? Wow. So it, it's like it's it's nuts just to to be able to like I said to experience that because then you know it opens it opens you up, you know. Uh, there's some people that you know they don't get a chance to to travel and they you know they figure that you know they, they read about stuff you know and they're they're knowledgeable about it but that's only half that's only half of it that's like learning a trade you can read and learn in a book but you got to have that on the job training you got to be there to really yeah. get it you know what I mean yeah. so yeah if you get the chance to experience that and you know give yourself give yourself a good like you know five days five days to a week you'll be good stay at the hilton on the nile oh no shit. there it is but you know, don't get into the nile river this motherfucker this motherfucking uh taxi driver says yes go and drink the river of the nile is gonna make you feel better and it's youthful that motherfucker said drink that motherfucking said drink and and that that water is it's, it's it's fucked up it's fucked up but it's like drinking camel piss yeah yeah exactly yeah so make your plans ahead of time because if you go there it's going to be some guy that's going to pick you up and say all right i know my friend you have some place to stay i know my friend has a hotel then i know i have my cousin that does this then my, then it's a whole family thing so you be giving that whole family all your money because they do everything of They're course tour guide cook restaurant a hotel the whole thing taxi limo uber whatever he'll tie your shoes you know, you know whatever for a price he'll wipe your butt <laughs> he'll give you yeah <laughs> let me stop let me stop yeah. <laughs> oh shit <laughs> it's probably 10 13 and we're already here to midnight in my mind but anyways um really quick really quick um Hey, big dog! Can you go give me another beer real fast? Do, do you want a beer or no? No, no, I'm good. I'm good. Okay, good. I just wanna. I just need to fill up my fucking pineapple. Okay, okay, cool. Really fast. So we talked about comedy. We talked about horror. Talked about action. Okay, let's let's really fast. Um, one of your favorite actors of all time, and I'll give you mine first. Clint Eastwood and of course I love Unforgiven, Good, Bad, and the Ugly, and all that shit. But Gran Torino was the shit. Great movie. Fuck. Great movie. Gran Torino. Yeah. The story, the way he was in it, the way he acted, it was, it was incredible. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah, that was a good one. So that's one of my favorite actors. Um, what is one of your favorite actors if you have one? Um. De Niro, De Niro, De Niro, uh, Marlon Brando, Marlon Brando. You know, but De, but De Niro, early De Niro, man. I mean, you see him in Casino. You see him in Taxi Driver. Him in in The Deer Hunter. Yes. Him in Godfather Two. You know, what I mean, this. And then he, ex, you know, he, he's comedic too. You know, you see that in The Meet the Parents and <laughs> and the later shit. But his early shit was serious. Okay, I'm I'm gonna play spoiler real fast. Okay, fuck this this one fucked me up. My older brother hits me up. He's like in his sixties now. Uh, when my family moved from Mexico, they moved to Compton. He used to claim the gang one five five in Compton. I was nine years old when we moved to Wilmington. I've been here ever since. I never moved out the neighborhood. Everybody in my neighborhood knows me. I can walk down the street, literally go to the diner, go to Tom's, go to fucking Dom, Domino's, go to Taco Bell, go to fuck whatever. And everybody fucking knows me. This motherfucker pull up like, hey, yo, yo, bro, you good? Motherfucker, I'm just walking. You know, they think I'm fucking like broke or hurting me because I'm walking. I love walking. I love my alone time. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I, I don't know if you, you've ever like, I just need to be alone sometimes. Mm -hmm. That's just me. Okay. I love my alone time. So now. Um, I, I got a membership to the Natural History Museum in downtown LA. Mm -hmm. I like to go by myself sometimes. And, and I tell you, because I reminisce of when my older brother used to take me. And, now, and I have good memories 
you know, of my brother. Uh, take it, he was more of a father than he was a brother. So uh, my, my older brother was pretty much like my father in a sense. But now, um, me with my brother and with, you know, my family, um, there's a lot of close connections that I make uh, that I have because they've um, always took care of me when my mother passed away. And I, maybe I shouldn't be saying this, but because I'm fucking buzzed and it's all his fault. But um, before my mother passed away, she said that I was her favorite son. Mm. And I don't believe that that's something a mother should tell her, her kids, but she did. And it hurt me more than it brought me joy. Okay. But with that being said is that I understood it and I love her. And every time I talk about it, it, it gets me very, very emotional. Mm -hmm. So I don't mind sharing that part because I don't mind being transparent. Okay. But, um, and Eric, and I forgot where I was going with this. <laughs> That's good shit. <laughs> That's good shit. I, I like, I swear to God, I forgot where I was fucking going with this. What was the, I was talking about Clint Eastwood or some bullshit. Yeah, yeah, you went from Clint Eastwood and Gran Turismo yeah. to uh, your mom's. And then to this. And then to that. Mm. It's okay. It happens. It happens. But fuck. The fuck was I talking about, bro? <laughs> I was over here trying you, to freestyle yeah, shit. You, you, yeah, you were, you were going for a point. You were definitely going, going in a direction. Museum, I said the natural history. I took out my membership card. Fucking COVID is like the number one fucking cock blocker of all fucking time, bro. Yeah, you know, Fuck, um, dude. The thing, the thing about it is like, I mean, we. I think now, hopefully, people can appreciate what 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 we've what we lost, what we had. Yeah, yeah. You know, and when it does come back, that we can treated in a different in a different way yeah and you know at least for a little while because when shit gets back to normal then people are not gonna be remembering this and yeah. but, but that's that's the mistake yeah you have to remember all the stuff of what we lost and you know even whether it's not just losing like loved ones but time you know time with your friends time you know to do things to be out you know, you're restricted to where you can go and where you can eat and how you can be, you know, all this stuff like that. You know, we're, we're really, we're really in a, in a very vulnerable position. So that's why we should really appreciate yeah, all the stuff that what we do has. And when this thing opens back up, that we appreciate what we lost because yeah. this can very easily happen again. Okay, now let me ask you a Cypress question. Your your personal, whether it was with you or without you, your favorite Cypress Hill album. My favorite Cypress Hill album. Uh, it's going to be uh, a toss up between Cypress One, Cypress or debut album, and Cypress Four. Okay. Now, if I had to twist your arm. Your favorite Cypress Hill song? Cuban Necktie. From the Skull and Bones record. Wow. And the reason why I say that, I mean, for me, the lyrics on that, I mean, the the wordplay that B has on that is amazing. And he's telling the story, and it's just like so true. Like, he's hitting so many points, and he tells a, a history of Cypress and himself in that song. And... It's so many subliminals, but it's like right there in your face. It's 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 brilliant. It's brilliant. Muggs is doing the hook. Sin is on there, and it's the only song that one of the only songs that you hear all three of them on the track, like vocally. Okay, my favorite Cypress Hill album is Cypress Hill debut album number one, and it's still how I could just kill a man. Over. Over, even though this song, I believe, with the media was bigger, but for me, how we could just kill a man over incident in the membrane. Okay, I agree. Now, now let me ask you this: When you guys perform, what is the last song that you guys perform? 
the last song that we uh, we started to switch it now, but uh, we would usually go out with Rock Superstar. Okay. Uh, in recent time, we've been ending it out with Insane in the Brain. Um, Killer Man, although they just like it, it fits in like in our power set. Like okay. when when we, it's like banger, 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 banger. That that's got to be, it's got to be in there because we have a little different intro to go into it, and then we drop it. You know, so yeah, that's that's how we that's how we do it. I mean, we're usually like doing like twenty two to twenty five songs in a set. Wow, oh, I want everybody to listen to that. 22 to 25 songs on the set, okay? And the reason why that's important because today when I interview artists, yeah, the promoter only gives me five minutes. You know, and now me being a DJ, I could fit three songs in that motherfucker, okay? Because I've had people that have told me, can you, can you like choreograph my show? Mm -hmm. It's what we do, one verse, chorus, one verse, chorus, Two verses, you know, chorus, chorus, and then we end the outro music, five minutes. Or let's do that. And I've DJ and I got paid. Sometimes they've even paid me more with, than what they got paid. Mm -hmm. Or they pay me $1,000. Okay, well, I want 800 You got it. And I did that. And um, I did that for a lot of rappers because, number one, I know my worth. I choreograph a lot of shows for a lot of rappers. Okay? And I can name them, but I'm not going to. But, oh, they gave me 15 minutes. Let's do this. Let's do this. Because a DJ knows when to play a song at a certain time. Yeah. Okay. They got the crowd jumping. Let's go to this song. Mm -hmm. Let's go to it. You got to know how to read the crowd. You got to know how to read the crowd. Every fucking single time, hey, we got a show. Okay, cool. You guys wait right there. I go, go out there, look behind the curtain. Okay. We're going to go with this song, this song, this song, this song. And we're going to end with this outro music. You know, we're going to start off with the You come out here, type hyping up the fucking crowd. Fucking hit the instant replay machine. Beat kicks in and start fucking hyping up the fucking crowd. You know, I know how to do that because I've been doing that since like the 80s, bro. And I've learned from the best, from Dr. Dre, from Joe Cooley, from Tony G and all these guys. So I know how to do that, you know, but, um, Today, a lot of these guys were in an era where they don't fucking need a DJ. So I stayed out of the production side. No, no more. I'll just do interviews and I'll direct. Hey, Tony, I need a beat. Well, how much you willing to pay? $25 a beat. Motherfucker, $25 wanting to pay my fucking Taco Bell bill. You know? Because I order like one number four, one number six, and one number mm. I'm just being sarcastic, but... It's you know, you have to you have to know your worth, and and I think that some some people they they want to, you know, I, I know they want to get their thing on and everything, and they want to go you know the cheap way or whatever like that, yeah. or, or promising you know what, uh, you know I'll put your name and you know and part of the title and and I'll do all this and blah 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 and you know and, and that's not the, that's not the way this shit works. I'll honor your name forever. Eric. It's not. It's not. It's not the way this shit works, you know. But you know, everybody. You know, everybody's got a different hustle. Everybody's. You know, but you know, just you know, respect. You know, just have respect. Yeah. You know, I mean, don't don't come to an OG in the game and you know, come to him like he's a new booty in in, in the game. You know, you can't what? someone come up to you and and going to ask you for help with something and yet pay you like you, you've only been doing this for three months well that's okay i'm gonna confess something okay in 2006 dj quick hits me up and says i want you to start djing for me again because i was djing for him in the early 90s did you quake second to none amg high c i was high c's producer and i was his dj but since we all traveled together i was all of their djs okay i stopped dj for them from 91 to like 94 and then i started doing a lot of chicano rappers from 96 to like 98 okay uh, i did a lot of chicano rappers 
And then I uh, just doing out of, out of the same studio, just doing a lot of uh, independent artists, but I was still charging like twenty five hundred a track. You know, you want to be cool? I still had an old analog board, and I was that was my vocal room, and I was doing a lot of shit. Okay. 2006, Quick kicks me up. Hey, I want you to start DJing for us. Me, AMG, we got an album out. We're going to be called The Fixers. We have a song called uh, Can You Work With That? All right, cool. I want you to DJ for us. 2007, we're going to start traveling everywhere. But 2006, we got to lay down the groundwork. All right, cool. In 2006, they get a multi million dollar deal with Sony. Here's what Sony said Quick. You take too long producing records, we want two records worth of music, or we're not gonna release any money. And AMG, you gotta lose weight. That's what he said. We're living in an era of image. Both of those two guys said, in a nutshell, and I'm just saying in a nutshell, both of those two guys said, fuck them. So they dropped them. They didn't, they didn't wanna comply, okay? Quick was saying, you're not gonna dictate what I do. Mm -hmm. AMG says, Fuck that, what about Fat Joe and what about fucking Big Pun? I'm gonna stay fat. Cool, whatever. So for one year, I, I DJ'd for them. We've traveled everywhere. Then our last show was in New Year's night, 2006, going into 2007 at the vault in Long Beach on Pine Street. Mm -hmm. I DJ'd for them, it was a horrible show. Horrible show. I choreographed all a quick show. We need to do low Tao Hood. We need to do this, we need to do this, we need to do this. Okay, Tony, had the instant replay machine already ready. My scratch is already ready. Quick tells me, hey, um, Tony, hey, uh, let's say a prayer before we go out there. No problem. We all hold hands, say a prayer. Hey, uh, Tony, do you still have the track listing? Yeah, put it on. He goes, <laughs> throws it away. Fuck it, let's just freestyle. What? If we're gonna go into the new year, we got a freestyle. Bro, we don't even have a fucking plan. What song do I play? Fucking security. You got to go up on stage. Quick, what song do I play first? You just fucking threw my fucking track that we've been practicing for a month. Just go out there. So I'm out there on the fucking turntables, and I look at second to none, and I was like, you're telling me this. I don't know what the fuck to play. Play a fucking song. They go out there, start doing shit. Quick, quick goes out there, no lie, on fucking roller skates. Nobody knew he was gonna come out on fucking roller skates. He starts doing the fucking, the Russian shit, you know? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what the fuck is he doing, you know? You know, whatever, we do the show. One of my worst shows ever, okay? He blames it on me. Tony, yeah, you were afraid of DJ. Nah, motherfucker, we had shit fucking planned. Mm -hmm. So he fucking pays me my money, I'll see you tomorrow. All right, cool. Here's what I did. No fucking lie, Eric. Mm -hmm. Called one of my boys. <clears throat> the very next day, in uh, January 2007, January 1st, I called him. Yo, bro, can you give me a job? Yeah, I can get you a job. All right, cool. You know how much I was making for like almost 10 years, bro? 30 bucks just picking up trash at a fucking warehouse in Compton. So for 10 years... Fuck music. I had a pincher, throwing it in a fucking dumpster, making 30 bucks for a Teamsters union. Full benefits, whatever. Steve Viano passes away. I felt that I had to do something. I spoke at his funeral. Dre didn't even fucking show up. We had over 800 people at his funeral. Dre just sends flowers. I spoke at his funeral. High C comes up, speaks at his funeral. So I told his wife, do you mind if I make a documentary? Keep in mind, I never fucking directed a documentary about his life so that his name lives on. Tony, as long as you don't speak about his personal life and you speak about him at the swamp meet, no problem. Nope. Cool, whatever. Made a documentary, quit my fucking job, and here I am. <laughs> so, here I am. You know, but things happen. You're on a mission. You're trying to do something that's going to be done, in, you know, I mean, for in a positive way, you know, and if you believe in it, you got to keep on going. Absolutely. People have asked me, Tony, where have you been for the last 10 years? I'm going to tell you right now. Local 572, Team Series Union. Look me up, biatch. Straight up. That's what I've been doing. I got a fucking job. You know, you know what was so dope about that? 
nobody knew who I was. Mm. And I was just picking up trash with a fucking pincher. Working in Compton, blacks and Mexicans. It, you know what it was like fucking county jail, but with 30 degree weather. Mm. Like it was fucking dope. Put on my fucking headphones. Duke, 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 uh, Duke, Duke. That was it. That was it. And I get 10 years. Where's he been? He just came out of nowhere. Motherfucker, I was working. Full benefits, supplying that shit mm -hmm. for my kids. So, so. That's yeah. it, man. <laughs> so, and here we are. <laughs> Drinking on letter. There it is. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Uh, Reyes Jefe from Durango. So. Mm. Okay, we're at three and a half hours. Shit. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> this flown by. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. At this time, brother, any shout outs, anything you want to promote, anything I didn't ask you. All right. Um, definitely. Uh, for the people out there, uh, you can catch me on my socials at... Um, uh, on Twitter, at Eric Bobo on IG, at Eric underscore Bobo on uh, Facebook, at Eric Bobo Music. Uh, a couple of things I got going on. Uh, April, I was saying, uh, album Empires with uh, myself and Stu Bangers that's dropping in April. And uh, for those also that are interested in uh, the cryptocurrency kind of thing, uh, be uh, the first to uh, get the Bobo token, which is a fan token, and you're going to be able to trade it for uh, special items, yeah. special prizes, special things, and eventually you'll be able to cash it in also for money. So uh, you go to www.bobotoken.com and sign up and subscribe, and the newsletter is going to be coming out very soon and let you know what to do, how to do it, and when to do it uh, as far as uh, getting the token. And also, um, just to thank everybody that has supported me and supported Cypress and my work with them and the Beastie Boys for all these years. And uh, thank you guys for having me on Rhodium Radio. This has, been, this has been fun. This has been great. Most definitely, brother. Most definitely. And you know what? Eric, I want to say thank you for coming, accepting my invitation, chilling with me, drinking with me, kicking it with me. It like truly, truly means everything to me, bro. So with that being said, and the reason why I keep fucking my phone is motherfuckers keep fucking blowing me up. Like, <laughs> it happens. I don't care. Motherfuckers know I'm fucking live and fucking blowing me up. Okay, so um, Eric, like the way I consider Joe and Tony my favorite DJs, you're my favorite percussionist. Thank you. So, Thank you very, uh, very much, man. It gives, uh, it gives me an uh, incentive to keep on going and uh, keep on rocking the stage because, you know, it's something that I love to do. And, and as long as I can make music that uh, makes people feel good and want to want to get the groove on or want to jam or whatever like that, that's what I'm here to do. So thank you for your words and thank you. Most definitely. Um, can we get your bongos over here? Uh, they're somewhere over here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So before you bust you a little, you gonna have me play, man. I'm faded. Yeah, yeah. Before you play, <laughs> before you play, before you play anything, let me give my shout outs. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. First of all, let me give a shout out to you, number one, to your girl, mm -hmm. and let me give a shout out to my boy Anthony. Let me Reyes Keno. Did I say it right? Reyes Keno to your girl. Let me give a shout out to uh, Marisco de Aguirre. Let me give a shout out to Abel and uh, Three Bueno Micheladas with the fucking fancy ass pineapples. Let me give a shout out to my boy B. Scalas for helping me promote this. Let me give a shout out to Alex, Alex Cervantes for uh, exposing Miss Pac Man. And um, other than that, um, let me see, is there anybody else out there? My boy Cujo. Uh, my boy Cujo, let me go ahead and uh, give a shout out to him. Other than that, um, 
Hey, you know what, my boy? Anthony, that's the motherfucking man right now. Anthony is the motherfucking man right now. Um, and once again, we'll be back Sunday with another motherfucking special guest. Every Bobo in the fucking building with his girl. Every Bobo from Cypress Hill. You know what I you know what I want to do? I want to give a round of applause, Eric Bobo, for having a uh fucking star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. So everybody, let's give a round of applause. Hell yeah. Thank you. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. So Damn, people are walking all over me right now. <laughs> How many of you motherfuckers can say you had Eric Bobo on your fucking podcast? Okay. Um. Other than that, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Like, subscribe, share. Go to Dr. Green Thumbs. Like, subscribe, share. I don't care if you subscribe or like and share to his stuff. I don't care if you guys talk shit, but you guys are watching. So, all you haters out there, you guys are just like secret fans. Like, seriously. So, we're good. We're out of here. I'm going to take one more shot of this fucking unleaded mezcal from Durango. And uh, we're good. So... Eric, hermano, muchas gracias. Oh, man. And you know Igualmente. what? This will not be the last time you're here, okay? I hope not, man. Okay. This was really great, man. And, and thank you. You know, you guys have been great. Uh, props out to, to you and the whole team. 310 Micheladas. You know, thank you. Yes. Uh, whole crew, man. Thank you. Give us at least a little 10 to 15 seconds. Uh, you mean and like, then we're out of here. Yeah, you mean like. You mean like that? Yeah. Like, <laughs> no. <laughs> no, 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 no. All right, let's all right. go, guys. Let's go, guys. All right, all right, all right, all right. I'll right. right. do a little something, something. Let's go, let's go. Right. Tan. We're out of here. There it is. Sunday, motherfuckers. Go eat that hot ramen, cheap mother. <laughs>